Hello and welcome to the Exotic Pet Collective, where we talk about tarantulas, scorpions, and all pets exotic. I'm your host, Richard. You may know me from my YouTube channel, The Tarantula Collective. And today we have a special guest joining to discuss tarantula husbandry and information in the hobby. But first, this week's episode is brought to you by the tarantulacollective.com. If you're looking for care sheets, a list of reputable tarantula and exotic pet dealers, exotic pet enclosures and supplies, as well as discount codes and tarantula collective merchandise, then be sure to check out the tarantulacollective.com. Find all things tarantula and exotic pet related and stay connected and up to date with everything happening in the collective by visiting the website. And if you want to look behind the scenes, be sure to sign up for the mailing list so that you'll receive the collective newsletter. That's at the tarantulacollective.com. Today's guest is the creator behind one of the newest and most exciting products in the tarantula hobby. With the completion of his first successful Kickstarter campaign, his product has swept the niche and has been featured in Tarantula YouTube videos by some of the largest creators, shared and suggested across all social media platforms, and he has recently announced the much-anticipated second Kickstarter campaign. I'd like to welcome to the podcast Danny Damon from Keeper Cards. Welcome, Danny. It is nice to see you. Yeah, it's very nice to see you too, Richard. I appreciate you coming on to the podcast. Um, I, I, Actually, I just got these in the mail. I don't know how long how long ago you sent it, but I haven't even opened it yet. But I got I got this uh, the new edition of the uh, the keeper cards. I guess it was it was probably about four or five days ago. I was one to open it on video, and I just haven't had a chance to record it. But before we get into the new Kickstarter, uh, can you just explain what keeper cards are for people that you know maybe don't know, uh, haven't heard about it? Of course. Um, okay, so keeper cards um, are a visualization of an idea. Um, I, I started collecting tarantulas as many, many of your listeners, um, may have done the same. I ended up with many different species. And what I'd find was you can, you can, you can write, handwrite a label to put on the front, but I wanted to do something a little different. So I created essentially what you'll find at a zoo on an enclosure. You'd get an information card with its scientific name, maybe what its common name is, along with some information about just general information about it, a little map of where it's from. Um, and sometimes you don't always get to see the animal that's in the enclosure. So a little picture as well to just sort of just remind you what you've actually got in there, especially with tarantulas and the majority of them being pet holes, especially the old worlds, or they hide in their cork bark. So that was the, that was the initial idea for the, um, for the car themselves, to create an information card just to pop on your, pop on your tank. Um, so... I, I won't go too far into it, but they were made for, initially they were made for myself. I, I wanted yeah. to create something for my own room. Um, and I showed Tom Moran of Tom's Big Spiders. And Tom Moran was like, oh, Danny, these are so cool. You, sh you should consider making these for everybody. Okay. Um, and, and that's kind of where it went from there. Awesome. Yeah, they're, they're very high quality. I was uh, impressed when you sent me the first box of the Keeper cards. I, I don't know what I was expecting, but they, they were... They're, they're very high quality um and you got a lot of a lot of different information on there which I, I thought was pretty handy um how many how many cards were did you release in your first edition um uh, in the starter pack there are 36 cards um i i've marketed it as six info cards with 30 species all of which you would normally i guess you would recommend to beginners so everything from the uh, Toledo uh, cattle albo pelosum, uh, your neo holothele insay, that kind of thing. Um, just just kind of your basic tarantulas that you'd find in the hobby. Nothing nothing particularly scary or nothing particularly fast or or what you would consider the the harder to look after ones. Um, that that choice of of of, of species came from. Like essentially my own collection and, and watching tons and tons and tons and tons of videos and reading tons of material on the internet and finding out what all the best beginner species were and things like that. So you focus your, your initial pack mainly on, on beginner species. Yeah. Yes, so, and, uh, pretty much. Yeah. So are these collectibles? Are they like uh, collectible Pokemon cards or are they more like, um, like, like tools? I guess they're more like tools. Um, 
I, I liked the idea of creating a collectible that you would basically buy through booster packs, much like, like your Pokemon cards or even your Magic the Gathering or many of the trading card games. Um, but being that I'm, I'm a one-man operation and, and, and the funding, especially as I, I've used Kickstarter for these projects, um, the funding to get that kind of operation off the ground is quite difficult. So I'm kind of reserving that for Series 2. Uh, but Series 1 is every, every card that's available is available to everybody. So you don't have to buy 100 booster packs just to get the same amount of cards that somebody who only buys 50 booster packs has to get. Um, you won't get duplicates, but it, op it gives the people opportunity to just to have everything straight away, which when you collect stuff, I mean, they are collectible. And especially with the YouTube channel Hero stuff, which we can, we can talk about in a little bit. I think ultimately they've got collectible elements and something I do want to do in the near future. Uh, I haven't been able to due to the 2020 crisis that we've uh, all experienced. Yeah. Um, in the UK especially, all of the live invert shows were cancelled. And consequently, I, I wasn't able to fulfill the plan that I originally had, which was to create very small limited batches that would encourage people at those invert shows to come to our table to pick up the latest sort of special edition. Um, yeah. But that's that's where it kind of rolls into the YouTube channel Heroes. So, yeah, I'll, if you want me to talk about that, I'm What exactly are the YouTube channel hero cards? Okay, so the YouTube channel hero cards, uh, the, the initial concept was to create a, a couple of cards that I would release at these invert shows, and I would pick YouTubers, I guess, I'm a little biased, but the YouTubers that I particularly like, um, the ones that I watch, the ones that really helped me, and I figured if they helped me, then they could help anybody in this hobby. Uh, I picked those guys and, and girls to choose their own spider, and then I'd get that card made as a shiny. Now, you don't get any shinies in the starter pack, so it was an opportunity to sort of delve into the world of hollow cards, because if you collect cards anyway, then shiny cards are all the rage, you know. It's what people love. So getting a YouTuber to pick their own species not only meant that people who watch that YouTube channel can learn about that species, but it gave the YouTuber a chance to sort of connect a little bit with, with our, our market, as well as giving the people who do collect the cards a chance to learn about a new YouTuber that they may not have heard of before. Oh, that's very cool. So they're, you said shiny, they're like the holographic kind of, um, like I, I'm thinking like Pokemon cards or something like that. Yeah, so you know, you, you, they they are, they are shiny, shiny hollow cards, holographic ones that in the light they'll they'll twinkle and you'll be like, ooh, shiny. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you get the uh, the images you use on the cards? Like you said, you had you had pictures of each species on there. Yeah, I, I essentially I, I I go to the community. I I use things like Instagram and I will I'll source pictures that I think look cool. Um, and then I don't just, I obviously don't just pinch them. Uh, I don't just steal them. I, I get in touch with the, the the creator of the image and, and ask them for permission um, with the incentive that their, their name's on the card as well. So if you're somebody who's like, for example, just name dropping um, Arachnid Addicted, they're an absolutely fantastic Instagram account. Um, I've used a couple of his images. Um, I think Matt Coverdale as well. Um, he was somebody I used from the beginning. He he really likes the idea of the cards and then wanted to help in any way he could. So I, I rinsed his Instagram account and uh, found some <laughs> of the some of the best high quality images I could get at the time. Nice. It, it became a challenge afterwards though for the for the second pack because initially when I was creating the cards, it was easy to go online and go, "Hey guys, has anybody got a picture of?" Uh, I don't know, a, uh, we got here, Samapoas Reduncus, nice and easy. I can do that. And then someone would be like, yeah, there's a picture. And I'd be like, cool. And then I'd message them privately and go, do you mind if I use this for this project? And nine times out of 10, everyone's been absolutely cool and been like, my spider gets to go on a trading card. Hell yeah. Uh, but this time with the expansion pack, I didn't want to give anything away as to what I was putting in the pack. So actually going out there, I've had to sort of be a bit more secretive with it and, and yeah. actually contact them directly and be like, hey, you don't, you might never have heard of me and I am this and I really want to use it for this. Don't tell anybody. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a bit of a challenge this second time getting those images. Yeah. 
but it's it's, it's also fun because you, you get to connect with other hobbyists, other other photographers, and other other designers and other creatives that really love what you do as well. So, yeah, that's that's very cool. So, what what's the second uh, expansion pack that you got? The Kickstarter just launched for that. Um, can you give us some information on that? Like, what I know you're not going to tell us what's in there, maybe, but <laughs> a little bit of insight. I I, I I can I can I can elaborate to be honest. If uh, if you want to hear, I, I I will tell. Awesome. Um, so we created this next pack, and like I said, the starter pack was predominantly focusing on the basic uh, beginner species that you would find. A couple of um, more experienced ones in there. I've not complete, uh, completely um, eliminated old worlds from that. Um, however, the, the big, the bad, the bold, which is the name of our expansion pack. For anyone watching the video of this podcast, there's a little shiny box there, which um, Richard also showed off as well earlier. Um, inside this package, you'll find the same amount of cards as the starter pack, except we're covering Therophosa, we're covering uh, Palinobius, we're covering, um, let's have a look, we're covering quite a lot of species that would be more considered experienced. Uh, HMAC, for example, Heteroscoda maculata, um, Stromatopelma calciatum. So the ones that if you were beginning, this this might not be the pack that you would go to immediately. But if you want to learn more about some of the more experienced, uh, or so some of the more, oh, how would you say it? You need the experience to have to have these species. Mm -hmm. Then um, this is the pack to go to. Things like the reason it's called the big, the bad, and the bold is because I've covered big species. Um, I've covered the badass species, if I can if I can say that. Um, they're not bad. There is no bad tarantulas i think all tarantulas are equally wonderful um <laughs> and then the bold so the ones that are feisty the ones that will bolt the ones that will run um so things like is it the argocephalus esemdami um the syriopagopus uh, lividus um and then like more beautiful ones like the dolichothele diamantin uh, di should be able to pronounce that by now diamantinensis um, <laughs> Ephibopus cyanathus. So there's there's definitely more in this pack. Um, we take we took into account some feedback from other from other videos that people had featured. Um, I think it was the deadly tarantula girl. She she gave me some quite valuable feedback about the first pack, saying you know it was it's all great, but some of the species it would be nice to have multiple specimen um, rather than just the same one on each, on each card, which. That's a fair point. So I made more of an effort to do that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those packs that, like, we released it today. It's already doing really, really well, and I'm sure we'll, we can throw some links about later for it. If you're interested in spiders, maybe you can't own 60 different species. Maybe your space in your house doesn't, doesn't allow for that. Maybe, your, maybe Maybe your parents, if you still live with your parents, don't allow that. Maybe your partners don't allow that. Maybe the wife is like, look, you just got 13 last week. You should probably like hold off a little bit. So this gives an opportunity for people to, I guess, cherry pick from the cards that we've done, which species they might like to go and get next. That's very cool. Now, where have you always been into cards? Like what, what gave you the idea? Like I, it never would have crossed my mind to make kind of like trading cards for tarantulas. Like do, do you collect like baseball cards or magic cards or anything like that? I liked Pokemon cards. Like that, that was my that was my jam. Um, I, I couldn't make Tarantula Pokemon cards because Pokemon would have me. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But ultimately, I, I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of keep the the information that I was providing on the cards quite scientific, uh, you know, fully scientific. Really, I didn't want to give. I think it's probably very difficult to identify which species is faster without having some form of like race set up for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you, how would you tell between if a Neo Holothelia and, and a Samopoas Reduncus, which one's actually faster? You'd have, you'd, the, the amount of scientific measurements that would be required to kind of get that information would be quite difficult. It's also like battle statistics. I mean, there's only so many times you can be like, yeah, he kicks hairs and he bites. Um, yeah. So you'd have to kind of, I have an imagination, and, and boy, oh boy, do I! Um, I would look. I, I, I've been told I should kind of do something a bit more fantasy with some spiders, which 
I think a big invert battle system would be amazing. But for keeper cards, um, I can't really do them like Pokemon cards. So to go back to the question that you asked, I, I, I also like top trumps. I love, I love top trumps as a kid, you know, just reading the information or playing against other people. Again, I couldn't make top trumps. So this is a combination of the idea of having the information for, like, like you get on a zoo, uh, on, a, on an enclosure about the lions and the chimpanzees or whatever you're looking at. Um, combination of collectible trading cards, um, like Pokemon style with, with the pictures and stuff, but no, no battle information. But then also the, in, the, the scientific information that you would find on a top trump card. So I think most of that stuff's usually quite accurate. Okay. And, and where are you from? Like, uh, where are you located in the world? Uh, I am located in sunny Manchester, uh, United Kingdom. Okay. All and right. I say sunny, very ironically. <laughs> okay. Famous for its rain. <laughs> um, you, you referred to trop, tump, top trump cards, and that's not something I'm familiar with. And I don't know if it's just me or if that's like just kind of a UK thing or it, what is, what is, what are. It may very well just be a UK thing. I never considered that it, it might, might not be available anywhere else. Okay, so for, for people who don't know what a top trump card is, um, top trumps has got nothing to do with the, pe- the president. Um, top trumps are information cards. You'd find them sort of either landscape or, or even portrait, and they'd have like the volcanoes of the world as an example. So it will tell you the height of the volcano. It will tell you when it last erupted. It will tell you a little bit of information about it. Um, and, and what you do with top trumps is you split the deck between two players, and usually you'd pick the statistics on those cards, and the one with the highest statistic, or if you were going with the lowest statistic, um, those people uh, you you would play against somebody else. So if I was to use my own cards, my own cards as top trumps, and I'm going to pick uh, the Samapoas Cambridge, Cambridge I. Uh, and then I'll pick a um, Theraphosa Sturmy. Now we know that the Theraphosa Sturmy is a bigger species than the Samopoas. Um, but we, on my cards, it says up to 11.5 inches for the Theraphosa Sturmy, which is pushing it. But that's why I always use up to, because I know like not all of them will ever make it that big. But there are specimens that have. And then the Samopoas Cambridge goes up to eight inches. So in the top trump game, it would work that the Theraphosa Sturmy would win if you were saying, well, the biggest one wins. Or if you did the one that's the, like, the one that lived the longest. In this case, um, the Theraphosa Sturmy lives longer than the Cambridge Eye again, so the Theraphosa Sturmy would win. So that's, that's kind of how Top Trumps works. But it's not just volcanoes. You've got cars, you've got military vehicles, you've got animals. I think they even did, um, they didn't do a spider one, but they've done an invert one. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's something that if you haven't heard of top trumps, they've been going for many, 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 many years. So they're worth a look Very at cool, as well. Cool. I, I know when you, uh, initially released these, uh, I, I saw a lot of people leaving comments on Facebook and Instagram and stuff confused about exactly what they were. And I think some people were expecting kind of like a, a magic, the gathering type of like game, uh, based around the cards. Um, but, but you're saying that's, that's not really what it is at all. They're, they're, essentially you're like little tiny like like care sheets essentially for each one they are tiny um, little care sheets yeah um but even that i think may be pushing what they really are the information that you'll find on a keeper card is information fairly that you may find scattered across multiple sources the internet books um other videos and things like that um i'm not saying that the information i provided isn't available out there but what i've done is i've spent I spent many, many weeks on each species, learning about them, and that that should bring me back to the beginning of keeper cards because when I got my own, when I started my own collections, I really, really, really enjoyed, and I still do, uh, really enjoy researching that species to its fullest. I want to know, I want to know exactly what that species, uh, or not that genus, where they come from. I want to know how they live. I want to know how big they get. I want to know how long they live for. I want to know if males and females live different, like, differently. I want, I want to know everything about them, what type of hairs they've got on them, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, if they're terrestrial, um, if the new worlds, old worlds, that kind of information. So I, I basically began collating this information um, before I'd created a card. 
and then put it all together into a card, essentially. So, yeah, is they are they are, they are care cards, but the only care element on there really is this thing that we've got called the moisture system, which was a conceptualized idea by myself and Tom Moran of Tom's Big Spiders. Um, if you know Tom Moran, uh, Tom, well, I think most people probably do in our hobby, Tom doesn't really like the temperature humidity thing that goes on. So a lot of people obsess with very specific temperatures, very specific humidities, and he's always kind of been an advocate for not doing it that way. He, he prefers to say, you want to moisten down one side, let it dry out, and then, then reapply. Um, certain species require certain levels of moisture as opposed to a certain humidity. That way, the humidity comes naturally from the fact that you know that your tank is a certain moisture instead. So we came up with a moisture level system, and it's, it's quite as simply as dry, slightly moist, and moist. And then you can know whether or not your species needs to be kept. None of them ke they kept damp, but certainly things like the Therophosa uh, require a little more water. Things like the Brachypalma, the, the Toledo cattles, require a little less water. So that was a system that, that I really thank Tom for helping me kind of uh, bring together because I, I originally was going to put on quite specific temperature and humidity in every single card. And that would have more compl complicated things a little unnecessarily. Yeah, definitely. People really seem to to latch on to those. You know, like, like in one video, I'll talk about room temperature. Like, I I, tell, I just keep all my tarantulas at the same room temperature. And people are like, well, what's room temperature? And I'm like, well, somewhere between, you know, like 68 to 74 degrees in that range. And But if I say, like, in one video, 72 to 74, then they think, okay, that species can only be in that small. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just room temperature. Like, what? It, it's not it's not that big of a deal uh but one thing i've noticed just from like making my own videos and care sheets and stuff like that um is that people are very uh particular about how they keep their tarantulas you know and if you come out with information that is somehow uh, slightly different you know like maybe it, like you're saying that it's moist but they keep theirs dry or it gets to uh it can grow up to 10 inches and they think that it can only grow up to nine and a half inches there's a you know, they're, they're trivial details in a lot of ways, but people people will get very uh, upset or, you know, they, they really, um, they base a lot of, I don't want to say they base their identity, but their belief structure on how they keep tarantulas is, is pretty solidified in a lot of ways. And, and they take it very seriously and are very vocal if you're suggesting a way of caring for a tarantula that isn't the way they do it. Like, have you had to deal with a lot of... Um, Kind of like you know, do people disagreeing with the information that are on your cards, or like where do you where do you even get the like the size of the tarantula, or you know how they keep them? Like where where does that information come from? That's a fair question. Um, we've had one or two people more as of late. Um, when I first did the starter pack, nobody heard, nobody had heard of us. So um, essentially, when I released that pack, any any negative, and I wouldn't even say negativity, but certainly any conflicting sort of views on on the information provided, it was kind of, I guess, knocked on the head a little before it even started because I, I got Tom Moran to check over this information and being a bit of a husbandry le legend, generally speaking, people were like, Tom Moran said so? Well, then it's got to be right. I mean, if they were like, Danny Damon, they'd be like, who's Danny Damon? You know, no one, no, no one knew who I was and that's fine. You know, I, I, needed, I needed a level of credibility to be able to to be able to say that this information is even remotely correct. Um, I think you'll always find there'll be people who are set in their ways, and, and if it's working for them, then fantastic. Um, I had one, one incident recent. I wouldn't say incident. Um, one example recently was I posted a picture of a card, and that person, somebody turned around and goes, that doesn't live that long. So I'm like, okay, well, I, I've go into the question of where do I get my information from. Um, Again, I'll watch. I'll watch videos. I'll read scientific papers, and I, I will. I'll do my best to to find multiple sources that kind of clarify this information. There isn't a single piece of information on these cards that hasn't been uh, looked at more than once. I, I don't just go Google. Yeah, how long? Okay, cool. Fifteen years. Yeah, and uh, what's that? Yeah, okay, two years. And uh, what's that? Yeah, all right. I, I absolutely make sure that I'm looking at many many sources and that's why it takes me so long to make these cards i think if i was chucking them out like 
well, every couple of months or something, a new pack. It, you could question where, like, well, hang on a minute, his information's probably probably just guessed, or, or you know, it's he has pitched that first first result on Google. Um, when in actual fact, I've looked, I'll, I'll look everywhere for this information. So when when this this incident happened, um, I, I I went, you know what, I'm going to just double check because I don't want I don't want you anyone thinking that my information is not credible. So I went and had another look and and spent spent about the, a, a day and a half just double checking everywhere and absolutely everywhere was still saying what I'd put. So in the end, it's just you just kind of got to go with I guess there's a line, isn't there? And you're going to got to go with your gut and be like, well. If if ten people have said this, this one mm-hmm. person's opinion, whilst it might be valid, doesn't appear to be as as confirmed as the ten people that said, "Well, it lives for this long." So yeah. you, you just kind of go with that, don't you? Yeah, I get that a lot on uh, my species specific care videos. You know, like like I'll I'll talk to people, I'll do my research online, I'll pull up scientific papers, and you know, people want me to like turn these things out every week. And I'm like, well, it takes a lot of, a lot of time to research because I have my experience and that's the majority of what I'm sharing. But there's also other information that, you know, I, I've got a pool from people that do this for a living <laughs> or, you know, at, at least have some kind of scientific background because I don't want to put out misinformation. That's, um, it's the big one, isn't it? I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. you. You create your awesome care videos and you provide your care sheets online. Um, you're in the same boat as myself. We, we just want to make sure that the information that we're providing out there is is absolutely accurate. But inevitably, there's somebody out there that disagrees, you know, and they'll leave a comment and they'll be questioning, well, you know, you're, you just said this tarantula grows to eight inches, but in reality, they only grow to six and a half inches. And, and essentially, like, I don't know who they are, but they have this idea in their mind that this is how it is. Uh, and and it was it was getting frustrating because like I don't want to argue with people, um, but like you said that like multiple sources have said this, and so what I've started doing is when I make a video, I write down all of the different places that I got this information, <laughs> and then when somebody is, uh, leaves a, a nasty comment, um, you know, or even not even nasty, just you know, uh, arguing a point that I made or a fact, you know, I, I cite my source. Like, well, look, I I am not a researcher. I've never claimed to be a scientist or a biologist, but this guy is, this is where I got my information. This is the reputable source I used. If that's wrong and you have the ability, you have resources you can cite, then you should probably contact them and get them to update their information. Exactly. If if they know what they're talking about, then surely to God, they'd be the ones who who told, told everyone else about it. Yeah. But usually when you, you push on that topic a little bit, it turns out they're, source that they're citing is a post they read on facebook or you know my tarantula only grew to that size and it's like well not all tarantulas grow to the exact same size like can you imagine if aliens came to our planet and and they they met somebody who was five foot five and they were like yeah humans grow to five foot five yeah (laughs) well like wait a minute i i'm i'm six three you know (laughs) i must be like i'm I'm the theraphos of sturmy you know (laughs) I guess not all of them will grow to 11.5, but this is why I think wording is definitely something I've been very careful of on my, on my cards. Again, I put up to, then you can't mm-hmm. argue with it because if, if it only grows to eight inches, well, yours might have got to there, but the other sources that I found this information from, theirs grew to this big. And maybe yeah. it's down to, down to your care as opposed to the other people's care. You know, I, I don't know. It's same with the ages as well. I won't say... I'll say the, you know, for example, I don't know, the the Sturmy. I've got down that it it can, the female lifespan is is there as is, is no is no more really than twenty years, and that's that's a long time for any spider, and an environment can change. Your your room can change in in some way. You might have changed your substrate. The water that you use maybe may have changed the piping. I I don't know any anything any elements that you've you've been used to might change, and therefore. That twenty years now might become eighteen for you, or if you're lucky, it might be, it might become twenty five, and then so you've got to kind of find a good average and and go with go with go with like I said, go with your gut essentially sometimes. Yeah, and I feel like the genetics of the spider probably has something to do with it as well. You know, like if you just like you know with with any other animal or person, you know, <laughs> two short people breed, they're more than likely going to have a short kid. You know, it, it it's just kind of the way that works. So yeah. You know, I, one thing I like to do a lot, um, and, and like I've made mistakes. Like I'm not saying my stuff's perfect. Like, uh, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a mis- mistake of mine in a moment. It's funny, but you go um, first. Yeah, I, I made a video about 
I want to say this is all Mopius or Minya, uh, the Venezuelan sun tiger. And I, while I was doing my research, I, I was, I can't even remember. It was some website. Uh, but they were talking about how the tarantula can double clutch. And, you know, I know a lot of a lot of species can do that, but I thought it was interesting. Um, so I wanted to put it in my video. And I, I'm. it wasn't that the information was really wrong. It was my wording. Like the way I said it uh, was wrong. And what I meant to say was like uh, it can have, Two, it can it can produce like two egg sacs uh, from one pairing within a molt, but what I said was it can produce two egg sacs after a molt. You know what I mean? Like just just that one word, and I didn't catch it when I was recording and or editing, and I put it out there, and then my comments blew up. Well, they they can't produce an egg sac after a molt. I'm like, oh, I know that, but you know, I it's I, you make mistakes. So what I was wondering, like not just if you make mistakes, but you're 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 playing a uh, I don't want to say a dangerous game, but you're uh, you're making cards on you know same situation I'm in. I'm making videos about species that are constantly having their names revised. Like it just seems like oh, it, there's so much research going on. You know, I I made a a video on the Mexican red rump tarantula. Uh, it was a the Brocky Pelma Vogans at the time. Like I I, re I released that video on Tuesday. Um, Monday and so I had recorded it you know a week before and I've been editing it and, and getting the thumbnails and everything ready and then like Monday afternoon before I like I was already up on YouTube I just hadn't made it public yet they switched the name from Brocky Pelma to, to Legato or however you pronounce that and I was like you gotta be kidding me <laughs> like I'm still gonna release it I'm just gonna change the the title you know, but through the whole video, I'm saying Brocky Belma, and you know, so do you, you look in the day if you know what you if you know what if you know what you're looking at, especially if you're watching these videos, people are gonna go, you know what? If you look at the date and you go, well, hang on a minute, yeah, I see where he's, I see what's happened here. Yeah, but technically, if you do that on that video in particular, uh, I, I was a day after the name change, <laughs> so some people are are not very forgiving, but. But what I'm, my question is, what I'm getting to is, do you have any like plan in place for, uh, you say you release a card on a species and then uh, six months or a year later, they reclassify the genus. Uh, are, are you going to release like updates? Oh yeah, definitely. I, it, it is, I'm not saying I'm counting on them changing names, but it'll definitely help sort of revitalize the line every now and then. It'll give me an opportunity to go, hey guys, we all know that this one changed and this one changed. So I'm releasing a two-pack special where we can get, you can get the updated ones. This actually happened to me when I got the um, the six prototypes for the Kickstarter sta uh, starter set made. So it was the Toledo Cattle situation. I ended up with um, I was featuring the Albo Pelosum in there, and I had a bunch of people message me like after I sent the cards to them, going, "Yeah, this this isn't called a Bracky Pelmer anymore," and I'm like. Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> I didn't change the name, but I, I know. So I, I obviously made that change before I had them mass printed. But then I had another issue, um, which is still in the starter pack. So it's one. It's probably the first card that will get updated from it. Is um, what was known as the is it the Dav Davos Pentaloris? Is it the Guatemalan Sun Tiger? I think so. Uh, I might. Be, it might not be Guatemalan. It's it's as it's. I'm sure it's. Is it a tiger rump? You know they've all. I'm not very good with the common names, but I have keeper cards, so they'll help me. So this particular species, it's not a big change, but that last letter in its in its name changed. So yeah, Davos Davos Pentaloris, uh, Guatemalan tiger rump. See, I got all of those words, I just didn't get them in the right order. Um, this thing now is a Davos Pentalor, apparently. So I, I don't quite understand what the difference between the Oris and the Or is. Unless it's to do with female and male naming, and I don't mean the, the gender of the spider, I mean the actual word. Uh, right. it, it, it gets it gets a bit complicated. But as far as updates are concerned, that is something I will do. If if suddenly Therophos has become something else, then you know it gives us an opportunity to release a new card. People will be excited to to pick up that new card. Very cool. Uh, yeah, that was something I was I was wondering when i uh i first got my pack in because I, I knew my experience and i was like oh man what's he gonna do if they completely do like like the brocky palma genus they split it in half and they do something like that with grandma stola like you know now now you all of a sudden you've got a dozen cards that are out of date as far as the name is concerned but i think that would be cool like once every year to kind of release a uh an updated yeah 
Now you had mentioned um, you, one of the like the reason behind the cards, kind of the design was um, kind of like an info card that you would see on a display at a zoo. Um, now I've got a lot of enclosures behind me, and I've been using um, this like Dymo label printer that I have at work to like put out the scientific name and uh, common name. Um, you know, and it's it's not mine. Um, it it it's where I work. It's it's company owned. And so I'm kind of at the mercy of whatever labels they decide to buy for that. And recently, probably not recently, probably like six, eight, maybe, maybe, oh man, time means nothing right now with all this COVID stuff. So I think it was probably like a year ago, he uh, switched the type of labels he was getting. And, uh, you know, for whatever we were using it for, it, it was, it seemed to work better. Uh, the issue is that it does not work well with acrylic enclosures or glass enclosures. And it seems to get wet. Like, so I have this issue where a lot of my labels have started peeling off or like just completely falling off. Uh, or like the ink, if they get a little wet, just disappears. So uh, now I've got a white label on there and I'm like, oh, Jesus. Which isn't usually a big problem. But there are a few species that I have right now that I am not 100% <laughs> sure. Like I'm going to have to wait till they grow because there's little slings and stuff. So it's like. I'm not sure which one of these it is, and with the wait till it starts showing some adult colorations to. I'm like that with scorpions. I have like maybe three of three of those where I rehoused them and just I'd run out of label because I I I I think with the the issue that I have with ultimately create using these as labels on your on your tanks is these don't like being really wet. Uh, I don't think card and paper particularly enjoys being wet, so. What I'd recommend is if you get the, because they're just standard poker size, uh, the, the same, pretty much the same size as Pokemon cards as well. Um, you can get the plastic sleeves that they go into. You can even, if you want to get something a bit more upmarket, they do those really hard, really hard plastic ones, uh, which would probably be even more suitable for these cards. And then, yeah, I think you could, you could have the, the room as humid as you'd like, and then, and then the cards will survive. Um, that's kind of where, where I was going with my question. I, I was wondering if at some point you are going to uh, uh, like have available some kind of uh, encapsulated enclosure for the cards that would stick to like an adult enclosure. That is something I am, I am definitely in, in the process of actually sorting out. Um, they, they may very well be a little more expensive from myself because I, I, I'm probably going to get the higher quality ones. But I think you'd still be able to fit them in. I think I think the company's called Ultra Pro, uh, Ultra Pro trading card sleeves. They're available on Amazon. They're available on the internet, uh, and even most most geeky shops that sell your your, your trading cards. Um, generally, you'll get them from there as well. But what we what we actually are doing, um, in, if as an alternative to using these on your tanks, is we're creating a, a collectible binder. Um, which is available through the Kickstarter, which is on is is now available. Um, in there, you'll have sections for uh, new worlds, old worlds, information cards, and then a my tarantula section as well as a fourth option. So that way, you can keep the cards you the, the species you don't have can go in the sections. The species you have, they'll go straight into my tarantulas, and you can you can just have a look. I highly recommend those dy Dynamo or Dymo label makers. If you've got the right labels, <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're decent. They are. That's that's what I use. I use the. I think it's just a paper label, to be fair. But I've I've had not ma no ma massive issues with them or anything. It's just when you wash the tanks, that's when you'll <laughs> see a later label. He's making yeah. another one. It's part of the fun, right? It, for years, it, it worked perfectly because we you know we were getting these like high quality kind of, and they were. Uh, they weren't just paper. They they had they were some kind of like uh, laminate. It, it, it would they it was impossible to to pull them off. But they, they like the they, embossed uh, ones. Have you seen yeah. those ones? Yeah, I don't think it was that nice. But you know, we were we we sell a lot of uh, coins and and stuff like that at my job. So it it was good for for that. Um, it would stick on there. We have to worry about it falling off. And I just you know kind of import my spreadsheet of all of my my species and then i could just print them off each on their own little individual label and, when the boss uh, wasn't looking <laughs> yeah it, it, it worked out really well um but then we needed to switch to ones that were like easy peel so we could put it on something and take it off and put it on something else like move it around and that's when i started having problems yeah they'll start falling off yours yeah 
yeah, just a little bit of humidity or something like that, they'll just peel right off. And it, it got a little frustrated. So I'm trying to find another solution right now. I'm just kind of like handwriting labels and sticking them on there. I'd love keeper cards to have been, if I think keeper cards will work for that. But if you've got, if you've got three Brachypalma Homoris or something, or you're going to struggle to get one of each card on there because my packs only have one Brachypalma Homori in it. And you're not going to want to, you're not going to want to buy three lots of starter pack just to be able to get those species covered. So I think in the future, when I do series two and you can get, I'll do a booster pack version and then you'll start getting multiples of the more common ones, then they may be perfect for it. But for now, I think, yeah, if you can get, if you can get yourself a decent Dymo label maker uh, and then use in, like, in conjunction with my binder and my cards, because I want to, I want to push those to people. Um, then, then that kind of that'll work for people. I, I think, I hope. But also, all my cards are numbered, so if you really want, you don't even have to write down the the, the name of the, the the actual tarantula on your tank. You you could just get a sharpie and very neatly in the corner write the number, and then that'll that'll mm-hmm. go straight to the cards. Nice, that's pretty handy. Now, I'm not. Um, calling you an old man by it because I have a feeling you're probably a few years younger than me um, but I think it would I, I think it would be um, I, I think we should at least talk about the fact that uh, like baseball cards uh, football cards a, a lot of these kind of trading cards similar to what you're doing are moving to the digital space like they're they're being tied to uh, essentially like, like blockchain type cryptocurrency so that, that you know that this one's rare and, and you can trade it digitally um, have you thought at all about doing keeper cards, having like a digital format or, you know, like you buy a starter pack, you get the actual cards, but then you also get digital versions. That is something def- definitely. I, I have, I have like 12 pages of, of an entire app planned out for, for keeper cards. And, and again, that, that will tie in with series two, because I want to have something that you, you can scan the cards and then they will appear in your app. But not only will you be able to access this information, but these these actual sp- it's, I guess this would be more of a, this would be more of a game. But I want to have it so you can have a virtual spider room, and oh, then that, you collect cool. the different. It won't just be tarantulas. One day I'll have scorpions. One day I'll have centipedes, and and all the other inverts that you can possibly think of that would be in our hobbies, and even the ones that you can't you can't actually have. Um, I'd like to have all of those available so that you could have on your phone. Like almost a very intricate Tamagotchi system, you know the I don't know if you remember the cyber uh, virtual cyber pets, yeah, the little keychain ones. So essentially, it'd be a high tech version of that, and you'd have shelves, and on your shelves you would have your different tanks, and then you can organize your tanks where you want to go. Where you want like I I personally have mine in my room as separated into New Worlds and then African species and Asian species. Um, the Australian one is in with the Asians is, is pretty close. Um, but that's what I'd want on this app. And so you would be able to buy a pack, a booster pack of keeper cards. And in there, maybe not only are we giving you new species to put inside that app, but you'd also may, maybe unlock, I don't know, brand, branded tarantula tanks. So like tarantula cribs or, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, Exoterra maybe wanted, one day want to get involved and you could get an Exoterra card and then otherwise you're you're kind of stuck making but you get a basic level of like i said i've really thought about it and there's a lot of there's a it'd be a hell of a hard thing to try and explain fully but <laughs> the idea is is that it gives people a chance to play hobbyist without having to have any spiders and or have yeah. any inverts because there's like i said there's always people out there who will find this stuff super interesting but they just have they just can't keep they're not allowed to or like I said, the wives, the the, the mums, the dads, whatever, the, the how, wherever they live. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of uh, controversy right now, um, both here and you know across the Atlantic over in your country with uh, specific species not being allowed by the government. Like I saw, I think it was Arachnotube posted a, a video or something like that about, uh, what do you all call it, DWA or something like that? Dangerous Wild Animals, I believe it stands yeah. for. You need a, specific, yeah. a very, very specific license. And and I think that's fair. I mean, I I'm, I stand with Gar from a no tube on on that particular subject. Yeah, I think it's it's irresponsible of us um, to not particularly make a stand against those people who would sell 
a 15 year old a buth day scorpion something a bat tail uh, which has that uh, is it necro necrosis venom i can't remember the name of it it's it's it basically rots your arms away and, and, and attacks your it just it just attacks your respiratory systems and, and it'll kill you these things shouldn't be available to unless you've got the license because that licensee uh, the licensor so will come around and make sure that you have a suitable place for it but not only that if if say if say if i had one and in, i was the only one in manchester and then somehow, some way, somebody in Manchester was stung by this this creature. They could turn around and go, "Well, uh, who's got one? Danny's got yeah. one." And mm-hmm. then the, the you know the, the right authorities can be like, "Well, where is it?" And you're like, uh, "I don't know." Uh, you know, it, it just kind of protects people. And I think ultimately, just to kind of finish on that, on that, at least uh, like on the point I'm trying to make. If we don't stand for, if we don't stand for those DWA animals being sold correctly, the animals that we are allowed to keep that aren't particularly dangerous, it'll become a, it'll become. I don't know. I think the mainstream will start looking at them, going, "Well, hang on a minute. Why, why, why can, why can an eight-year-old have fifty tarantulas? Why, why can, why can Danny have of fifty tarantulas? Why, why is it okay for any human to have?" this many different species of animals just in their back room. Um, and I think it'll, it'll only take the one bad thing to happen for that to sort of snowball into something really bad. So, yeah, I, I agree with him. And if, if keeper cards can do something where you can keep a DWA animal virtually, then maybe that'll, that'll uh, satisfy some people sort of craving to have those dangerous animals in their collection almost. Yeah. I think that's uh that's a, that's a cool kind of workaround having that ability to, to collect them, uh, but not actually have to keep them. But you know, something you said, like I, I, uh, I believe as far as a hobby is concerned that we should all be following, you know, the guidelines and laws that are set forth by the governments in the cities or, you know, counties or town, you know, whatever, you know, there's it's federal government or local government. We should, we should be following those as responsible pet keepers, you know, to, to keep the hobby in the best light possible. Um, but sometimes I think that those rules and regulations, uh, are developed out of, um, just a lack of understanding, you know, a lack of knowledge. And, and I'm just speaking from my experience. I, I don't know what's going on over in your country, but I know sometimes, you know, it's just like socially that's creepy and we don't understand why somebody would want to keep it. So we're just going to say, you're not allowed to have that. And in which those cases, you know, I think that it's good to have people that stand up and fight against it. Like, look, we're going to educate you on why people can or how people can you know why they would want to keep this species and how they can do it responsibly you see that a lot with snakes over here um you know people will be like there's no need for a human to keep a venomous snake and it's like well they're they're beautiful some of them are endangered like there's there's a lot of reasons why somebody would want to keep one um but they should be doing it responsibly uh but i am a, it's a, my situation is a little bit different than yours um there's there's really no dwa thing at least in my state um in fact uh, I, li- I live in West Virginia and kind of not, I wouldn't say famous, maybe infamous, but it's, uh, you, you can pretty much do keep whatever you want. And sometimes that's not a good thing. You know what I mean? Like we were looking online the other day. It's like, legally I can keep a kangaroo in my backyard. Like, I don't know so why I, I, I legally probably can't keep a kangaroo. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and there are people that have kangaroos. I, I growing up, I knew a, a guy, uh, like a friend of mine growing up, his parents were friends with a guy who had like a bear and a lion on his property. You know what I mean? Like it, 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 it's, it's sometimes they escape and it causes problems and it's all over the news, but it's, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's one of those like freedoms that, you know, at least in our state, they, they try not to legislate too much. Um, but recently be a responsible lion keeper, you know, why, 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 why shouldn't you be able to keep one? I think in the UK, we don't have the space for it. And the majority of us, I'd say we live quite cramped. I think any of the UK listeners will agree. The UK is not the kind of place where you would have the space for a, a wild animal like like a lion or a tiger or a bear or, oh my, you know, any, any of those things. Whereas I know American uh, America's, you guys, your houses are like three of ours. You know, your, your gardens like go on for days. Uh, I'm not, I know that's not for every single American, but certainly cer- certain places will have much more space to be able to keep a kangaroo or 
I think the, the, the craziest thing you can kind of keep over here are like the small caimans or I think some people keep the, the anacondas as well. Like for some reason that's, that's okay. But snake wise, I agree with the whole like they, Some of them are just pretty. And even if yeah. they are venomous, you wouldn't go out of your way to get bit in the wild. So you're not going to go out of your way to get bit at home. You know, you're going to still try and be a responsible keeper. Um, but I think that's why we have the DWA license as well. Um, yeah. There's certain species that, like, you're allowed to keep skunks in the UK as a pet. Like, that, that, that would be very strange for most mainstream UK folk to think, well, why on earth would he keep a skunk? They, they, they'd have no idea. But, you know, we keep cats. And I always say my cat causes more damage to me than any of my spiders have ever done. Um, he's, he's a bruiser. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't keep skunks over here, but that's probably because I could just go outside and find a skunk. Like They're just, they're just are here, you know, same with like rabbits and deer. Like they just live in my backyard and moles. Um, and, and I don't like live out in the woods or anything. Like I'm in downtown or not downtown, but I'm like in the city. It's just, you know, we're just small and, and kind of rural, I guess, compared to you know places like New York or, you know, where you are in Manchester. Um, so we, we do have a lot more room, a lot more spread out, at least, you know, especially in this state. Uh, and I, I, I agree. Like if I, if it was a situation, like maybe somebody living in like Manhattan or something, maybe yeah, but they probably have some rules about uh, snakes, venomous snakes and stuff like that. Yeah. Because uh, people are right on top of each other. Something escapes very easily is going to end up in somebody else's apartment. Um, where here, I don't really have to worry. But I don't think a tarantula could survive just getting from my yard <laughs> across my yard to the neighbors, like without getting picked off by a bird or dog or who knows what other. Yeah. Or just die of exposure, you know, if it's in the winter or stuff. So it's, that's not so much. And, and I think a lot of times it's kind of the, you know, uh, the, the mindset that, it, I mean, if, if you're dumb enough to have a scorpion that that's, or a snake that's that venomous, and dumb enough to let it uh, bite you or sting you, and then you know that's just Darwinism. Yeah, like yeah, you, you just uh, that's your fault. That's on you. <laughs> and um, it's, when, it's it's I don't know. I guess it's when it's the malicious sort of somebody somebody might. And I'm not saying I, I don't know particularly any cases where it's happened, but if you fell out with somebody in in the UK, we don't have we don't have access to guns and things. So unless you're going to stab them or hit them with a hammer. I don't I don't recommend that to anybody. Um, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not endorsing any of that. I think you could potentially use a buffer day to sting somebody without them knowing it was even there, and then they get stung, and then they, they get seriously ill if they don't die from it. But that's why the DWA license is so important because you can trace who had them, um, and then because that's not something that would ever be just in the wild here. In fact, there's very very little in the UK that will do you any harm whatsoever. Um, the, the, the most dangerous snake we have, because we only have two species of snake, is a black adder. And even those things, y you'd be lucky to find them. Like they're they're so elusive. Um, again, I think I think cats are probably the most dangerous creatures we've got over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a slippery slope situation, though. Um, like I understand where you're coming from, and and it, but you, you also have to kind of acknowledge there's a lot of of those scorpions that are probably present in your country that uh, aren't registered that people don't know about, you know, my concern would be somebody gets stung by one of those. They check their list. They say, well, Danny's got one. They go to your house and want to like start tossing your stuff and, and asking where it is, where it's been, stuff like that. And you're like, it hasn't left this room, but you're the only person within a hundred miles that has one registered. So you're prime suspect. Number one. Uh, That's why it, I think Gar made that point about, you know, make sure you register, make sure you register legal and sustainable you know all, all of all of his his little things they all make sense yeah. he's he's a, he's a very smart very smart guy so i know you've you've had him on here haven't you so i have yeah yeah you've had the chance to chat to him and yeah I, I agree with his points on 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 that particular stuff especially over here people can be quite irresponsible uh so but i agree yeah. with you as well like <laughs> the worst thing in the world is like cool danny's got one of those and uh, nobody else is registered that they have one so they're coming straight to me. Yeah. And then, uh, it, it's the same kind of debate discussion as it is with gun control. You know, like if you're a responsible gun owner, you should be, a, you know, at least in the U.S., be allowed to hold it, uh, you know, carry a, a weapon or, or at least own one, in, you know, in your home. Uh, but then there's that, well, it can be dangerous if it's not treated right. And it's like, well, you know, that. so should we just legislate those rights away? Um, it's, it's, 
not something we, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very hotly debated uh, kind of topic. And, and I can see both sides, you know, like part of my job is actually buying and selling firearms. Like, so to me, it's, it's just another commodity, like, like gold or silver or coins or antiques or whatever, you know? So I don't see them the same way as probably you do. Like, honestly, the majority of the UK folk who've never seen a gun um, in person, they'll have seen them on television or, or, you know, they'll be gun experts on Call of Duty, but they'll have never, never even touched one before. Um, I, I had the, I'm going to say pleasure because it sounds, sounds like a weird thing to say. I had the opportunity to um, to shoot a few while I was over in, in the States uh, last year. Uh, a friend of mine, he let me have a go of some of his uh, in a safe environment, of course. Uh, we went to a range and we, 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 he let me shoot some guns. And it shocked me to my core, the the, the noise that they can make. Like you don't, you, when I've heard a loud bang in Manchester City Centre, I couldn't. I reckon I could tell you if it was a gunshot because of how loud they are. Um, things like the force, like you don't, you you don't know the recoil and all this. So, I think in the UK we just we're still very much like God. Why do why why do Americans have guns? Well, I can see like on two on two things. One is it's definitely the protection thing, and and my friend turns around and goes, well, because because he might have one and he might do something to me. Well, I've got to have one because I've got to protect my family and. Honestly, I, I see that logic. I, I do, uh, but the UK, we don't, we don't, we just don't have them. Yeah. So it's it's a very different world, you know. We <laughs> speak English, but boy, oh boy, we we have totally different worlds, really, when it comes to it that is. stuff. I mean, I think I shot my first firearm probably eight or nine years old. You know, your dad takes you out, you you go shoot a twenty two long rifle or something like that, and like we were shooting them in Boy Scouts, we were shooting skeet with shotguns and. You know, it just kind of grew up, especially in, in a more rural state like I'm in. You know, it's just, it's not even for self, like for protection against your neighbors. It's, it's more like you're you're protecting yourself. You know, you, you need to have a firearm to get the possum out of your trash or the bear out of your backyard or something like that, you know. or it's So much more to protect yourselves against. <laughs> yeah, you're going deer hunting or, you know, whatever. Um, and then, you know, as like, like we actually have... Um, a class three license so like technically we can manufacture and and sell um like silencers and i mean we can even do like fully automatic machine guns i mean that's extremely regulated and pretty much we can only sell them to cops like we can sell them to the police departments and it's one of those things like we have that um we have the license to it but we've never actually done it you know and it's it's funny because a lot of people kind of see me as this like huge liberal hippie in the tarantula community and it's like you know even a coin has two sides man like you know it's I, you can't really put anybody in a box you know and i'm not a huge advocate for gun rights um any more than i'm a huge advocate for people's i'm probably more of an advocate for people to be able to keep venomous animals than i am uh, to keep firearms and, and i don't mean to like go off on this gun debate kind of thing i just thought it there was there was a uh, there, there's just a, an interesting correlation between the two. Um, like there there was something going on in Florida. I was talking to Alex about it on the podcast where they had outlawed a lot of um, or, or some some of the more what they would call you know dangerous species of snakes in Florida. And uh, there was a U, an organization called US Arc that went in and kind of you know fought them in court and actually got that law reversed because I mean it was it was like you can't own these species. Um, and you're not even grandfathered in if you've already have them, like you just, you got to get rid of them or you got to pay us a thousand dollars a year for a license, uh, to give you permission to keep them. Um, and it, you know, so it's, I worry that stuff like that will happen to the tarantula hobby. Cause I think a lot of, a lot of people don't even know tarantula hobby exists, you know, like you, know, you may see there's a, a harmless tarantula for sale at your pet store and kind of be like, why would anybody buy that? But I think that as the hobby grows like internationally, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start coming on more people's radar. And as soon as that happens, then more people are going to be like, hey, we need to legislate this like we legislate everything else and put up restrictions and licenses and fees. Precisely and, and, the fear that we have. We, we, don't want, we don't want it to like, like people who, like I wouldn't, I don't say don't handle. I don't personally handle. And I, I'm not a big fan of, of I don't see, the, I don't see the, ne the necessity to handle a spider. But some people, they, they, they feel a connection with it. They want to handle it. So be it. However, if you're going to be handling something like 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 a pokey or, or, or a hmac or, or 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 something from from Asia in general, you you're gonna have a bad time if you get bitten. 
And then you're going to do something silly like post it online. So then the wrong people see that this person's been bitten or, you know, they've had to go to hospital because they've, they've been in that much excruciating pain and they don't know what to do. Then, you, then, then the wrong people see this and they go, well, hang on a minute. Why, why are those available? What, why, why can they have a P. metallica? Why are they allowed a, uh, I don't know, a Syriopagopus lividus or an OBT or just anything that's particularly got a sharp bite that, that, that will envenomate you? You know, it's, that, that kind of stuff scares the crap out of me. I think if people aren't responsible, and I believe like yourself, people like Gar, all good advocates for that responsible keeping. Uh, I, I'm, I'm the same deal. I, I don't have a channel, but through my cards, I still, I still state, you know, like things like, um, what, what do I say here? I say the information is not the only way of looking after the animals. So make sure you do further research and stuff. You know, I want people to push their knowledge with these animals, but I, I don't want people to be irresponsible with them. But it's honestly, it's, I guess it's not for me to turn around and say don't handle, but people shouldn't be handling pokies. <laughs> Bottom line there, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those, like, I don't think that it, it's responsible and it should, like, no one should be selling 14 year old kids, like some 14 year old boys somewhere, you know, a, a death stalker scorpion or, you know, maybe even a, a post Letharia species. But it's all, you know, but I, I am always hesitant for the government to come in and, and be the ones that are like, you need to have a license to do this or to own this, you know, like, would you I, carry I, on doing what you do and pay for the license? If that happened, you know, I, I really don't know. Uh, that's, that's a tough question. To, <laughs> I'm the one that's supposed to be asking the questions, man. Come on. Don't put me on the spot. I mean, I, I mean it, I don't want to be like irresponsible, you know, but uh, there's also that kind of libertarian streak that runs through me. That's like, you want to, you want to you want to take my you want to you want to reg regulate my tarantulas? Well, you have to come in here and you know Clint Eastwood style over my dead body, <laughs> kind of like you could take my tarantulas when you pry them from my cold dead fingers, <laughs> you know. And that's not the most responsible kind of. That's your next uh, T-shirt slogan, right there. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> like I'm not saying that's the most responsible uh, kind of opinion, but that's just you know that's kind of how you you, works. you 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 and all the other keepers out there, they spend a lot of time looking after their animals. They've, they've, a lot of us have raised them from <laughs> fingernail size, you know, like tiny little things. And, and we've seen them grow into these big specimens that are part of your family. That, that, that room that you're in right now, that, that is a room of family members, essentially, to someone like yourself. You, you, you love your animals. I'm the same. I, I love my animals to pieces. And I think if someone was to come in and be like, no, you have to now pay a license, I'd be, yeah, I'd be, I'd have that slogan. Yeah. But I mean, that's why I think it's so important for as a hobby for us to kind of regulate that, you know, like it's probably not a good idea to be selling old world tarantulas or scorpions or venomous snakes to anyone under the age of 18 without their parents permission. You know, like if we can, if we can self-regulate, then hopefully we can avoid the need for any kind of government entity to come in and regulate us. I think uh, a lot of people like yourselves and Gar and, and, and other YouTubers as well. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to use YouTubers as an example. Uh, there's other people out there who aren't on on video channels who also have the same sort of endorsement towards it. Um, we've all we've all basically I wouldn't say it's our responsibility, but because we have followers, we have people who listen to us, and some people out there are gonna every, every word you say, Richard, they're gonna be like, "Well, the Tarantula Collective guy said it, so that's that's the way it is." And and I think some people will will probably will definitely be doing that now, um, not just for yourself but for everyone else. And, and it's down to us to sort of be the responsible role models. Um, we're enjoying our hobby. We're, we're showing people these amazing creatures. Um, but we should also turn around and, and like you said, you, you said you don't think anyone under 18 should have those particular species. If they haven't got permission, then I, I, I concur with that. I really do. I think that's something very important. Um, it's, like, it's almost like an unwritten responsibility that we've, we've basically given ourselves. Uh, by providing this information where with the people people might look at and go how do you take care of this or should i keep one of these and i do yeah. see a lot of responsible beginners out there I, I rarely see a beginner go you know what i really want a single four blue and a cobalt blue and i want i want all the really you know you don't you don't see that very often at all and i think that comes down to the fact that they've watched videos by yourself by by tom by dart den by tarantula cat 
uh, and they've seen that you guys are very responsible keepers. You're very, very, very responsible, and Thanks. that is that's a trait that people want to copy. You know? Yeah, I agree, but I mean, I also maybe have a different pers- like vantage point um, because I have seen I get emails all the time from what sounds like some 14 year old kid. You know, that's like. I really want to get a cobalt blue for my first tarantula. I'm like, are you even old enough to drive? Like, the, how can you make that decision for yourself yet? Like, talk to your parents and and get educated. There's there's a lot of other species that would probably be better to start with. Um, and and as far as like you know, people looking up to YouTubers, that's like a double edged sword because there are people out there making YouTube videos that are in other countries and aren't really connected, you know, closely with the hobby. Um, that are making videos that are uh, having a negative impact, you know, that are sensationalizing dangerous behaviors and, you know, and, and, sticking them on your face. Yeah. And, and it's like those, those, and, and that's what people are drawn to. They're drawn to videos about somebody that got bit or almost got bit um, or something that's like labeled as a deadly tarantula or so, you know, there's the sensationalized videos that unfortunately usually become more of the clickbait that, get out there to the rest of the world than somebody doing a boring video like me or, or a Tom Moran about the, the, how to take care of the species and talking about it calmly. And you know, shows but, but then, uh, I, think, I think your videos are awesome. And, and Tom's like Tom's videos were like hell inspiration for me for this hobby. So yeah, yeah. it does show my age, <laughs> but like even within the hobby, there's a lot of uh, division and there's not a consensus on, on exactly how to, to handle these situations. Like, uh, Tom and I have even been at odds before, you know, he like, he, you know, talked about one of my videos on a podcast for like 30 minutes and, you know, it kind of like, it rubbed me the wrong way. I was like, dude, come on. Like, you know me, that's not the situation. I understand why he was affected. Uh, it kind of got triggered there, but it was, it was, and I, you know, I love Tom. Like I, I still watch his videos. I, I think he's a great resource and, and, and so I'm not saying anything negative about him at all. It's just a difference in opinion that the two of us had, but I had made a video about uh, dangerous tarantulas and he didn't like the fact that I used the word dangerous. And in my opinion, it was like, when you look up the definition of dangerous in the dictionary, it's, you know, something that has the ability to cause harm if not handled properly. You know what I mean? Like riding a skateboard can be dangerous if you're not being careful. Yeah. And I, I stand behind that. Some of the species of tarantulas can cause you harm if you don't, take care of them you know if you don't take care when you're you know interacting with them and that's that's kind of where i was coming from but some people just read the headline they'll they'll read the thumbnail or something like that and be like you know you're sensationalizing uh tarantulas and you know what and he mentioned in that podcast um that uh it's kind of his mission to like maybe kind of demystify or you know get pokies and and other old tarantulas kind of so people aren't that terrified of them you know, I think uh, you which, can not be scared of them, but I think you've got to still be aware that, like, I mean, obviously, I, I, I've got a, a link to Tom and everything, but I, I agree with you on the respect that the word dangerous is something that's going to cause you harm. And I've, I've seen, I've seen people's bites from from holding pokies. I've seen people who've got rashes all the way up the body because for some reason they thought, do you know what, I'm going to feed my therophosa without a top on. You know, oh jeez, I, I don't understand it. I do not get it. A, a, how you've got a rash all the way up your back off a tarantula just doesn't doesn't compute with me I, I don't understand it um i gotta tell you this real quick i was uh i was i just did a video uh the halloween special i think yeah uh, i already forgot what i call it top terrifying tarantulas or something <laughs> something like that uh, like halloween themed kind of tarantula and and one of the species i featured was the theraphosa and I was filming it, like it's in its enclosure, so it's the enclosure is like on the second shelf up on the rack, like right, by, right behind me over here. And uh, so I had to like sit down to get it a good eye level. And I'm recording this thing for like 30 minutes, and then like one of the like, I put a bunch of crickets in there, and it was attacking the crickets. It was getting some awesome footage, is really having a good time. And it turned its back to me and just kicked the biggest like cloud of hair I have ever seen. Like I could visually see the the cloud moving towards my face and i'm sitting there holding the camera and i'm like how do i get away? like <laughs> there's i can't move fast enough i'm sitting down with my legs crossed so i just like had to lay back really quick and like slowly kind of crawl away and i was like all right we're done filming uh, but even then i still like on on the front of my knuckles where i was holding the camera it still got me a little bit and i was like man i'm so glad i didn't i wasn't closer had my face in there like 
it's sometimes I, you know, I get into filming and I forget like he could kick airs at me at any moment and it's going to be, but I mean, I'm, I usually am like when I'm dealing with it, I am wearing gloves. I got goggles like, cause I'm, I'm, a, I'm a red, well, you're redheaded too. You know, sometimes we can have some sensitive skin. So <laughs> I make sure I'm protected, but for whatever reason, I was like, well, I'm feel, filming with a macro lens. I've got enough distance and no, that. That thing was shooting hairs three like three feet away. <laughs> it's a good job. Well, it's a good job. It was the species that it was because the hairs are that big that you saw them. You know. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty impressive. We had a Lassiadora escape on us. Um, uh, para, just just the Parahabana. It was my mature male, which is uh, one of my biggest species that I, I currently have. Um, and this thing, it was actually after a, a feed off challenge between uh, Rocky Mountain Spider Freaks and myself. Uh, the result, they won. Uh, it was almost a fluke, but it wasn't. They just beat me. Uh, <laughs> um, so it was it was their time. They're they're in the Rocky Mountains in uh, in Canada. Uh, so I think they were it was seven o'clock for them, and it was like three a.m. for me. So or two a.m. Sorry. So by the time I'd finished doing this video with them, it was about three o'clock. And the last spider I fed was this LP. So I'm like, cool. Took the lid off. It's an Exoterra tank. Took the lid off. Under the doors. Opened the doors. Fed it. It took the food. I'm like, yes, I got a point. Uh, I, I closed the doors. I didn't put the lid back on uh, the day after. Oh. Yeah. So the d- and I, honestly, I, I'm so careful because I, I, I share a house. Uh, I live above a pub. So not only is it always warm in this place, if something got out, there's, 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 there's probably all sorts in, in between the floors that the spiders could eat um, or they could end up in my boss's apartment. And that's when things get hairy. I mean, no pun intended on this case. <laughs> <laughs> um so to cut the long story short the next morning we find uh, the cats meowing over near the uh got a long corridor in our in our flat and the cats meowing um to speak of the devil he shall appear so yeah he's he's meowing and looking at the wall and i'm like oh, what's going on so the missus she goes over to the cat she picks up the cat gives him a stroke like We'd only just got up, so she'd like a dressing gown on or whatever. So this bit was exposed, this bit was exposed. And then about 20 minutes later, she she goes for it. So she's like, God, I'm quite itchy. Uh, so that I go and so the cat goes back to the back to this location again, starts meowing again. We're like, what's, what's wrong with him? So I pick him up this time, and I've got a tendency of picking him up like a baby. So I cradle him. I'm like, oh, you know, he's all in my arms and everything. So at this point, she's like, Danny, my face is kind of burning. My chin, my, my, my chest here is burning. And then I let go of the cat. Um, she goes to have a shower. And then we the cat goes right back to the same location. And I'm like, oh, God, I've got a bad feeling about this. And I oh, go down no. the corridor. And there's this LP on the wall, right on the wall. And what obviously what had happened is the cat had been like, oh, what's this? What's this? And this LP must have just been oh, kicking hairs at the cat. <laughs> so the cat covered in hairs. We picked the cat up. We had it all up on, all up my arms. Uh, she had it all on her chest and on her chin. So I had first thing is like getting tape on her face and like trying to rip all of oh, you know, like using duct tape and stuff. Um, we have to bathe the cat because for three days after the cat's kind of going, yeah. Just like sneezing and shaking his head a little bit. Everyone's fine. The spider's fine, if not a little bald on the butt at the moment. But <laughs> everyone's okay. But yeah. yeah, those those bristles, man. Like they might not be deadly, but boy oh boy, if you don't if you don't handle these these species correctly, they, they are dangerous. And I think that terminology for some people they they might not see the difference, but I think most of us do know what you mean when you say dangerous. You just got to be careful, yeah. and the fangs on 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 a on a theraphosa. I mean, if they're up to half an inch, you get stuck. You get stuck half an inch into your hand. If that heals up nicely, quite quickly, you're gonna have bacteria in there. You know, there's, there's all sorts yeah. of potential issues, and so there are dangerous species. And and I don't, you know, it, it wasn't just Tom. There there was you know quite a few people that took issue with it, and I don't think it was it wasn't so like we disagreed on the definition. Uh, or more, I think more accurately, it would be to say we the perception that it created. I think they were worried that somebody would, you know, re- like just kind of type into YouTube tarantulas or deadly tarantula or dangerous tarantula, and that video would come up, and they wouldn't even watch it. They would just be like, you know, look, there's 
there's a video saying that tarantulas are dangerous and it's like well you know if you watch the video it's different but i can understand the, the perception thing and yeah um, I, you know, I we, so we disagree to deal with isn't it yeah i mean we disagree on the, on the on the definition or perception of a word um not so much on anything really of, of any other material value and i understand where he's coming from you know he's kind of making it his mission to to make sure that uh, old world tarantulas aren't as scary as they have been made out to. I mean, because a lot of new people are scared to death of them. And like today, last night, yeah, last night it was Halloween, um, or during the day. Uh, I I was I had a lot of tarantulas that I needed to rehouse, and it just happened they were all like old world fossorials, which and like are are some of the most difficult to rehouse, you know, because they're burrowed in deep and they don't want to come out, and you know it's 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 it can be tricky. So, I mean, it was like, you know, three or four different species of chilabrockies. I was doing the uh, Haplocasta devamatha. You know, I got a couple of those. They're just gorgeous. Um, and they're like the only time I can get pictures of them is like when it's time to rehouse them or something. So, you know, I, I was like, I'm, I'm going to record this, set up cameras and record me doing this because I'm sure it's, it's going to be wild. You know, it's going to be difficult and a struggle. And I ended up turning the cameras off halfway through because it, it was so boring. Like nobody would want to watch it. Like everything went smoothly. There was nobody bolted. It was, it was essentially, I, I just, you know, scraped out some substrate and the tarantula came out and I cupped it up and I put it in its new house and it sat there and let me take pictures of it. And I'm like, yeah, this is, there, there's, there's, there was no danger really at all uh, because I was being responsible and, and doing the things the way I needed to do them. But it, it wasn't, it, it didn't make for riveting content, you know, like not a single threat pose. And these were all like, you know, cobalt blues. And um, I'm trying to think there was a couple of, like the Chinese bird spider, you know, it was just like all of these, you know, just, you know, old world. And, and they were, they weren't full grown. I was moving them all in, from like juvenile enclosures into like sub adult enclosures, like enclosures are probably a little too big for them. But, uh, and then some of them I was moving like spiderlings into juvenile enclosures but you know it, it the whole thing went super smoothly and i was just like well well that's oh, not a video <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think uh, uh rocky mountain spider freaks oh microphone yeah i think rocky mountain spider freaks said the same thing to me once uh, uh on a live stream they were like yeah we were doing a uh, a video about um uh, rehousing our our sea darlingis sarah Tajiris, you know the uh, is it the rear horn baboons so they, they they said they were doing a video rehousing. They bought a bunch of slings. They said they did. They, they recorded one, and because they were so small, they were like, "This, this is this is it." And then they just they just turned the turned the camera off. Like we're not we're not recording any more of these. They had to rehouse nine more of them, but they were just yeah. wasn't like you said, wasn't riveting enough. But yeah, and it's a I lot think of work. Some cool like, photos then. Yeah, photos are a lot easier, but trying to record that rehousing it's like it's it just adds a whole nother layer level of difficulty and frustration that's not worth it but that solidifies i think what you're probably going to say was about tom moran and and his like you said his mission to sort of demystify some of the 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 fear that some of these species have i think if you're just confident if you're if you're careful with the way you house by the way you handle then it's, it's it's they're not they're not scary i i i'm not i'm not frightened of any of my spiders anymore I'm just wary of my pokies and I'm wary because they're so bloody fast. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's good to have that respect for, for these species, you know, to know what their potential is and be prepared for it. Um, but like my, like my, like I got enough footage from just the few that I rehousings that I shot to get the point made that these aren't as scary as you may think they are. Like they're, you know, if you do this correctly and safely, you really have nothing to worry about. Uh, I was kind of hoping that there may be some kind of mishap, like one that was really bolsy or something, so I could have an example on video of how to handle that situation. But they just they they weren't they weren't doing that for me. Like the only only tarantula that I rehoused yesterday that gave me an issue was the Acanthoscuria geniculata. Like that one was just like it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna bolt around the enclosure and I'm gonna kick a bunch of hairs at you and, and not you know appreciate the fact you're putting me in a new enclosure that's a little bit larger. You know, but it's it, that's just how they are. I have my issue with the pumpkin patch spider for some reason. It's that was one of my only species that gives me a hard time, and it's a new world. Really? And it's yeah. It just honestly, this the first time I got it, I, I got it at an invert show, and I, I go to rehouse it, and it's the only spider I've ever had that did about fifty laps of its catch cup, and it was stomping. It wasn't just raw. It was wow. 
you could you, you could hear it proper stomping around. And ever since then, if I take the lid off, it, it's the only species that, that just tries to get out. Um, yeah. All my others, all my other, all my other old worlds, all my other new worlds. I know the uh, pumpkins are new world, but all my new worlds, all my other old worlds, they were all pretty chill. But that thing. Yeah, it's just a pain. <laughs> yeah, for me in my collection, the one that I got to be the most careful with is my Brocky Pelma, or I guess it's Tilicato Vargens now. <laughs> I love I, that because the Vargens is supposed to be like quite a chill one. <laughs> yeah, and people give me so much crap about it, and I'm like, look, I I understand that your species may be very calm, but mine is like I, I've had it for years and years, and it's molted multiple times, and it has never changed its personality. <laughs> it it. I open up the enclosure. It's immediate threat pose. I try to put in water. It's attacking. I mean, it's just trying to like, it's in its, it's final enclosure now and I'm not moving it. Like unless something seriously bad happens, like it's like, it's staying in there because it doesn't like it kicks airs at me, but it, it also, you know, slaps the ground, gives me threat poses, charges. Like I gotta be careful with that one, you know, and it's a, it's a new world kind of beginner species. And that's why I think I, I included it in that list in that video we were just talking about because it was like I, I really wanted to illustrate the point that you know it's not just old worlds like fast old worlds that you got to be careful about. Sometimes it'll be something like a rosehair tarantula or a, you know it could be a, a slow moving terrestrial typically beginner species that can just have a bad attitude for its entire life. I know I have made my starter pack pollution. with all these with all these beginner species in. But I swear, most of my beginner species are feisty. They are feisty. My um, my my my, my uh, Toledo cattle Albo Pelosum, That thing. Um, I wouldn't say it gives me any hassle, but I wouldn't. Ha I mean, if I was one of those people that felt like I had to handle the spider, it would not be that one. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go near it. Um, as much as I probably wouldn't go near almost. I wouldn't go near my Rosia. Like no way. Uh, that that thing. That that has a personality, and I love. That's what I love about that particular spider in my, in my collection. Yeah. You you can read its personality, and I don't know if it's because I've had them for so long now, but you know what they're going to behave like. And yeah, my Acanthoscura geniculata again. Like I could I could chuck in cricket after cricket after cricket. I don't overfeed, but I swear she would every single time. She would just she'd be scooping them up. And and if one wanted, wanted to get away, she put she put a leg on it, and then she'd be scooping up again. And you know. <laughs> yeah. It's these species that aren't supposed to be particularly like worry, worryful, I guess, worrisome. Uh, yeah, they are. I, I agree completely. Like the tea wagons, I, I unfortunately have never been able to successfully raise one from a sling. So I, I actually have three new slings that I've I had a few, like a month ago, um, which are all doing okay. But the two that I tried raising before just didn't make it, unfortunately. Yeah, and and that's something I I try to get the point across but sometimes just you know people don't watch entire videos or they don't listen and you know and it, you see this and i mean all across social media people see what they want to see or hear what they want to hear and they'll they'll for you know not pay attention to stuff that kind of conflicts with what their preconceived kind of idea of, of what the situation is uh but like the reason i like making the top 10 videos a lot is one because for whatever reason they're very popular people they're like always my most viewed videos but it's also very little science is in there it's just my opinion you know like in my opinion these are the best terrestrial tarantulas or these are the best arboreal or the best old world like how do you argue with somebody's opinion you know it's like saying your top 10 favorite bands is wrong uh, it's like well, can your it mean, just because it yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I caught a lot of crap from people saying like, how can you say the, you're an idiot. I think is, is the most common <laughs> comment I've gotten, you know, on, on the it's video. Half the where... reason I'm not a YouTuber. It just terrified. <laughs> I, I can't handle the rejection, man. <laughs> like you're a, you're a damn idiot for thinking that the Mexican red rump's a dangerous tarantula. I'm like, look, I'm just sharing my experience and opinion, buddy. Like uh, there's no, no scientific basis on there. I wasn't, you know, comparing venom toxicity or, you know, nothing like that. Like, I'm just saying to my collection, that's the one I got to be the most careful around or not. It wasn't even number one. It was like number 10. <laughs> it's like, but I, I you know, I, I got to be careful around that. So, I mean, we've, we've talked about, um, DWAs. We've talked about handling tarantulas. We've talked, I mean, 
it seems like we're hitting every controversial uh, topic. So, I mean, what do you want to talk about next? Abortion or uh, the U.S. elections? Um, how is I'm the election kidding. going? No, I'm just, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, we, won't go, we won't go into politics, by or by. I mean, as long as we're being polarizing, we might as well hit all of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I did want to, I did, there was another question kind of circling back to the keeper cards and, you know, just kind of what you, you have going on there. Uh, like, what are your, you, you mentioned some of your goals, but like when you started keeper cards like what what's your your goal like what why is it that you that you're doing this and and, and working forward um uh, to to keep it quite plain and simple I, I i i love the hobby um i i wanted to do something that would contribute to this hobby i i i played a band i, I i'm used to being on a in a niche sort of scene and therefore when i when i got introduced to to the tarantulas and and i found like I still to this day don't really know more than two people. In fact, I only know one person in person who keeps tarantulas. And I live in Manchester City Centre in the UK. We're a big city. Um, I know a few people online around my area, but I've never met them. Um, as far as the hobby goes, like I feel like it's quite an exclusive one, which I enjoyed jumping into. And I, I don't really particularly enjoy video editing, so I never really felt the need to do any YouTube videos or anything like that. Um, so keeper cards, I set out to do something that could help push the hobby a little bit, yeah. um, in my own way, you know, that's very cool. I like that. Like, and when you first came to me with the idea or, you know, asking me to kind of support, uh, maybe I think you asked me to, if you could use a picture or something like that and then share a post. And I was like, I really think this is a cool idea. I, I like what this guy's doing. Um, so I, I've been a big supporter of you. Uh, I, I think I even, got in on that first kickstarter i haven't signed up for the second one yet that's just it, it, it got launched like six hours ago dude you've got time and you you already sent me the pack so it's like that's um, true yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but I, I still think i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna support just just because i want to you know throw in some financial support help you do because i think this is, this is a very cool thing that you're working on and i highly suggest i've got i got a link um scrolling across the bottom here your website um you know people you got you're on facebook you're on instagram to uh you will be able to find the kickstarter there's a button at the top there that says click to go to instagram uh, sorry i say instagram i meant kickstarter there's a button that says go to kickstarter just click on that button uh and you'll find it'll take you straight to that kickstarter page where you yeah. can pledge um we have numerous different uh options on there uh including you know you can get the cards everyone who buys the cards within the first week i don't know if this is going to is this going to hit the? Uh, is this going to be out within this first week? Within the week? No, no, it'll be about a, a week. A week delayed. Oh, right, we'll cut, cut that bit then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll go back. Um, for people who want to uh, support us, we do have numerous um, numerous tiers available. One of those, if every tier comes with the cards, for the expansion pack. If you've not got any of our stuff whatsoever, you can also get a tier where it's got the starter pack and the expansion. But we've also got one where um so every pack will definitely come with an exclusive kickstarter holo card which you can only get through kickstarter um so there's a little bit more of an incentive there to, to support us uh, as well as we've got the binders an option uh, as an option um where we'll have the dividers and you'll get card sleeves in there as well uh, and we've also got a really cool t-shirt this was the t-shirt that i had done last time and um i did this myself that's why it's uh it's okay i like this t i think it's pretty cool but um, the the T-shirt that we've got for the second one, there, the, I, I like. I, it's, I suppose it's a play on words and uh, Jeepers Creepers, um, so Keepers Creepers. But we've got another Keepers Creepers shirt coming out, which has a very very cool design on it. It's it's all on our website. It's all on on the Kickstarter. So please, well, see, if you've got a chance, go check it out. Yeah, there's incentive right there for me. I, I didn't realize it was a different T-shirt. So I mean, I'm, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to chip in just to get that shirt. Uh, but for like I obviously I, I, de I deal a lot with like cameras and technology um and a lot of like the new lenses and and camera equipment that i use like even this podcast set that I've, i'm using right now i got off kickstarter I, I, but i i've realized a lot of people have no idea what kickstarter is so could you maybe explain how that process works so people go into it with some expectations that are reasonable of course yeah okay so if you've never experienced kickstarter before kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform where young entrepreneurs designers creatives publishers authors uh, artists anybody who's created something but doesn't necessarily have the financial backing behind them like a corporation may have um 
if you like, for example, the kicks the, for what I did, uh, the keeper card stuff, keeper cards was made a reality because people loved the idea of it. And so they supported us from, from in, in, and helped us get it printed. Um, so if you were to go to Kickstarter today, what you'll find uh, is if you go to our Kickstarter page, there is a bunch of reward tiers on the side. And each tier, starting from tier one all the way up to, I think I go up to tier eight, has something a little different in it. Um, all of them come with the cards. So it doesn't. what you do is you go, you know what, I want to pledge... I want to pledge the minimum amount to get the cards, and that'll be there. If you want to pledge uh, sixty-five pounds, which in dollars is probably like eighty dollars, maybe I don't know what this, I don't know exactly how much it is. You'll get the T-shirt, you'll get the, the the cards, you'll get a hollow card that's exclusive, you'll get the binder, uh, you get everything with that essentially. So just depends on what you're interested in, but all the information's there. You just have to go onto our thing and click, I want to pledge for this campaign. And then it'll ask you to pledge how much. And, and yeah, you get rewarded based on how much you pledge, essentially. Yeah, it's, it's a cool, um, I really like the crowdfunding aspect of it. Because it really helps us, you know, as a hobby and people, you know, in, in any kind of niche to, to be able to create stuff for that niche that has been pretty much unattainable just because, you know, you the, just the amount of, um, funds that are required to launch a product are it can be quite extreme and and that's why a lot of businesses fail is, is they they sink all this money into a project that for whatever reason doesn't you know kick off and, and they end up going bankrupt or it becomes too successful and they spend all their money in getting it off the ground now they can like fill orders until you know it's it's difficult so i think that's cool that you're doing it on kickstarter and i was just going to say one of the things uh, with that starter pack uh, kickstarter was it enabled us to continue trading all year round for it. So we got, I managed to get enough stock that's lasted me till now. Um, I've still got maybe like 300 copies of my starter pack out, out of the thousand that was made, uh, which is amazing to think that there's 700 people out there with, with a pack of these cards. And then those people are now supporting this pack. Um, and, and all the, all the YouTube channel heroes like R Richard is, uh, is one of our featured YouTube channel heroes. Uh, he, he pits the GBB, which is, the perfect species for a shiny card, isn't it? Um, yeah. I couldn't believe so you said it's that one yet. Oh, yeah. You were number three, man. You were, you were, you were, you were early days. Like you got, a, I picked you quite soon on, you know? Well, I appreciate that. You know, and like, um, I mean, I'm not going to plug this brand because they didn't pay me, but <laughs> like the, the, this podcast stuff that I'm, I'm making or I'm making the podcast with, you know, it's like a mixer, a mic, you know, everything that you needed. It was, it was kind of cool. It was a Kickstarter so I was able to like get it cheaper than what it's selling for retail right now, uh, and it was you know able to kind of help them have enough money to to launch the project. But it was like, uh, I think I actually chipped in on the Kickstarter in like January, and they were saying it'll ship in June, and then I didn't get it till September. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like sometimes you get it on these Kickstarters, and 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 situations like that kind of give it a bad name uh, because. You, sometimes it, it like you know stuff happens um like they had an issue with uh it, there was some kind of internal bug uh with it you know uh, and they didn't realize till the very like they were starting to mass produce it and they realized for whatever reason this isn't working with max it's only working with pcs so we got to like go back and redesign the motherboard and 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 move forward so it's going to be delayed and people get really upset even i was get irritated because i was like i don't use mac just send me the one that i don't care um what what I liked about your Kickstarter is that like everything you like you hit it seemed like you hit all your deadlines. Uh, I mean, are, I I that, nearly did. I was aiming for Christmas, and it, I I think I would have hit my my full deadlines had it have not been the little bit of fine print that I didn't take into consideration, uh, which was uh, I have I have this time round every every consideration has been taken, but the one thing I didn't take into consideration is how long does it take Kickstarter to release the funds. Oh. And that takes three weeks. Um, so when I finished the Kickstarter at the end of November, I'd, pr I'd, I guess I'd promised people that they were getting these for Christmas. Um, this time, I've said, if you're looking at around February before you're going to get this pack, and that's not because I don't want to get it there faster. If I could get it there tomorrow, you know I would. That, that would be a dream for me. But there's just time constraints that cannot be avoided. One of them is that Kickstarter three-week waiting list, uh, waiting time, uh, and then I've got my manufacturing process time as well. But 
you kind of got to look at it like in the terms of the unplugged uh, <laughs> podcast kit. The uh, they 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 didn't know that they were going to have these issues, so the time the extra time that they did, they they fixed these issues out and and ironed them out and like. When I've sent these prototypes to 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 yourself, to the other other thirteen YouTubers, um, one of them's not a YouTuber actually, but the other people who've got them, I've said, look, this is pro this is a prototype, and I need you to kind of look through it, and if you find anything that you think, wait a minute, that ain't right, or this is wrong, I'll tell you now uh, in my prototype, and this will make you super rare, Richard, and you've got one, um, the S Kelsey Atom, the photos aren't an S Kelsey Atom. And that was not intentional. <laughs> That's because I'd been missold one and oh. just presumed they looked the same. Yeah. So what, what is it a picture of? The Feather Lake baboon? HMAC? That, yeah. I, that's what I, I figured. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, I don't know how I made that mistake because I definitely saw enough S. Kelsey Artems to have been able to look at mine and go, I've been missold this. Um, yeah. However, I didn't. I just looked at its legs and went, they're feathery. Nice. <laughs> that must just be a feather. That must be the feather leg baboon, and and they come from the same area, so it must be the same. It must be an Escalcy atom. And it was Rocky Mountain Spider Freaks. They were like, Danny, why have you put two lots of H back on there? But nobody else has pulled me on it yet. So it's interesting. <laughs> I can't. I mean, I've told you now, but I've, I've not told anybody yeah. else yet. I want to see who well, else notices. Once I open it, I'll uh, I'll be sure to be like, act like I just noticed. <laughs> hey, Danny, look at this. This is wrong. <laughs> yeah, it'll um, be rare as hell, man. Like you know, this little, I'll never, I'll, I'll be changing that for the mass print, and you'll never see that again. So yeah, like I'm gonna be opening, like doing a video on the pack you sent me, opening it up, and kind of going through it and stuff like that. Uh, tomorrow, what is today? Uh, we're recording. Yeah, so tomorrow I'm, I'm doing the video. Uh, I mean, it'll probably be coming out the same week the podcast does. So that's be all sure right, to, dude. you know, if you're listening to this podcast, to check it out. Um, we'll have the, I'll have the video linked below if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, and I'm sure you, you know, just go to the my YouTube channel and you'll be able to find the video uh, by the time you're I'll listening. post it as well on my social media and I'll be pushing every, every single every single thing like anybody says about anything nice about us if the video's like Danny these are rubbish uh, obviously I won't be uh, I won't be posting that one but yeah and you know why for the YouTube video um, I'm also going to like be cutting in some footage of the pack you sent me last time I did a video on that, so people can, you know, have a have a good view, be able to see exactly what it is. Um, and now, how long is this Kickstarter open? Like, how long? Uh, when's the the cutoff date? It's a thirty day campaign, so it started on the first of November, and it will end on the first of December. Um, so yeah, you've got thirty days essentially to support us. Um, I don't know how I don't know how it's going to go, but uh, as of as of recording this, um, I guess. I can I can reveal that we are halfway there already. That's awesome. So that is cool, and and that's that's without anybody pushing it through any social media videos or anything yet. So, I mean, by the time this has come out, I imagine there might be a one or two out there, but we'll see. Uh, I'm excited, and I'm excited to see what you have to say as well, Richard. Like your opinion you. means a lot. Yeah. So we're just for those listening at home, we're actually recording this podcast. We're going to you know, pull back the, the curtain a little bit, reveal some behind the scenes. We're recording this on November 1st and it's not set to be released till November 12th. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> big, okay. big spoiler there, like the breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, it's okay. I, we're, this is what it's all about, man. Being transparent. <laughs> That's why I like this kind of long form content. You can really kind of get down. So this will kind of be like, you know, the, the, the Kickstarter will have been active for 12 days. Um, yeah, but, but that means that there's still, I mean, if I can do math real quick, 18 days left uh, to get in on it. Um, so, you know, make sure you're, you go to the website, check that out. I want to get that showing across the bottom of the screen here. Um, and you said there's different tiers people can can sign up for that has different, um, you know, kind of like, uh, what's the right word? Like, they'll get more. The more, obviously, the more you kick in on the Kickstarter, the more stuff you're going to receive. Absolutely, and, and, yeah. Do you have like a, a ship date? You, you mentioned February, but is there like anything more? Specific? I'm going to be shipping um, around the middle of um, of December. No, sorry, middle of middle of January. Um, I, I'll have most of the stuff by the end of December. So after Christmas, I think a lot of things will start to turn up because this takes, like I said, once this ends, it'll take three weeks for that money to to appear with me. I'll then um, almost 
so within a day or two, I'll order absolutely everything I need for this. Um, cause I don't, I don't want people to have to wait too long. I remember somebody posted a video of it going, yeah, I supported this Kickstarter like seven months ago. And I'm like, dude, man, you, you've, you posted this video in January and I only launched the bugger in, no, in November. <laughs> 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 yeah. So people are impatient, you know, they want it now, but I yeah. promise it'll be worth the wait. And I mean, I, so I've not mentioned, I should mention, uh, kudos to my missus. Uh, we make these little handmade bags. These are all made by her. So the more keep a, uh, more oh, wow. the more subscribers, the more supporters, sorry, we get, the more bags she has to make. So <laughs> if we can get 500 on there, she'll be busy. <laughs> the, I really like the bags. I'm actually, I use it to, um, I think I keep my, uh, one of my microphones in that bag. Oh, quality, man. <laughs> the yeah. last one. I was like, this is awesome. Yeah, um, man. I'll get, I'll, I'll, if you give me a, uh, the size of your mic, I'll get it to make a special one just for your mic. Oh, thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. Well, the, the, the last couple of things that I've ordered off Kickstarter, um, not only has it got delayed because of like technical issues or stuff like that, but there's also been some issues with COVID. Like I, I bought this podcast kit, like I said, in, in January or something like that. Uh, and then, you know, March, everything went crazy with COVID. So that had a lot of delays um do you anticipate any delays because i know you guys you're they just shut down the uk again didn't they are you guys on lockdown uh, from thursday uh which i guess by the time this comes out we, we will be in full lockdown again and uh, they're saying that's only till december and believe me i believe the government want us to keep doing like keep trading and, and keep things rolling so um a lot of my manufacturers for these things come from abroad anyway um so the biggest issue that we'll have is what the changes are going to be when we uh, on the 1st of January when we officially left uh, the European Union. So uh, the Brexit thing's kind of been shoved under the carpet a little bit because of all the COVID stuff. But unfortunately, that's still uh, still running quite strong as well in our country. So we'll just we'll just have to see. I hope and I pray and, and honestly, I really really hope that we do not have any delays because. It'll suck for everybody, including me. I'll get people going, where are my cards? And I'll start to answer a million people. I hope it's a million people. You know, Probably not a million, but certainly a few people will be like, I supported this ages ago. Where is it? And I'll be like, I know, I know. And I promise it's on its way. And they are. They're on the, they're on the way once, once, once I've got the, uh, them, them in my possession anyway. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I can only imagine how frustrating that would be. Like I, I, that's, that's part of the reason I was... Tried to be as patient as I could be. Uh, I know that I had tarantula cribs on here. They were also having some production issues because uh, were they Kickstarter they were, as well? I don't think they were Kickstarter. Uh, I don't believe so. He didn't mention that at all. I don't remember seeing it. But they they were sourcing acrylic for their enclosures. And here in the U.S., uh, pretty much every business now has acrylic sheets in front of the you know the windows, and it just it just you know it dried up the 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 mark re real quick. You know, it became scarce and expensive and it's like man that's that's a tough time to start an, a build a business that makes acrylic enclosures when acrylic's at an all-time high that's uh, it that's it i'm i've seen i've seen their success though so far they do they seem to be doing really well and i i'm just i know i know they're working on getting stuff over here it's not mm -hmm. something they can ship over here um but I, I i'm looking forward to being able to get some of those tarantula cribs over here i think they're really cool yeah. and they, they look smart yeah they're they're definitely some cool enclosures and they couldn't be nicer people. Like I, uh, that's one of the, another reason I really like doing this podcast is like getting to meet people like you and them, you know, cause it's like, I know you from Instagram or Facebook. I see your posts and, but like to actually sit down and have a conversation, it, you know, you get to know somebody a lot better. And I think that's why people enjoy listening to the podcast as well as it kind of, you know, gives them some, some, kind of peek behind the scenes or you know what this person's really like other than just the get light to know them a little better yeah i get that yeah. people, people yeah. want to talk to me then they can do uh I'm, I'm going to announce it now as opposed to it's not been announced yet but i am going to be taking a permanent position on the tarantula tuba saturday night takeaway um and that like that, that that's that's been decided today so um I'll let you know if this ever happened and uh, if it's all gone uh, skew with here. I'll, <laughs> we can cut this bit out. But yeah, I've been uh, I've been asked by the guys and, and Amy as well um, if I'd be interested yeah. in taking up a position properly. So I've I've kind of agreed, and that should be announced today, I believe. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, and for those listening that don't know what you're talking about, could you maybe uh, expand a little bit? Of course. Uh, the Tarantula Tuba Saturday Night Takeaway is a 
live stream that um, appeared on a Saturday night uh, on YouTube um, with some great, great YouTubers who all get together and they talk, they get guests on um, and everyone just talks about tarantulas and has a couple of drinks. You know, it's, it's a Saturday night out without, obviously, obviously with all the, the, the stuff, with all lockdown, especially in the UK, because everyone on the Tarantula Tuba Saturday night takeaway is from the UK. Um, it's, it's a way of them still getting to connect, still getting to socialize a little bit and, and, and share our hobby with people. Um, whilst other people are at home, unable to go out, they can, they can chat with us and, and talk to us and, and, and they, they play games, they give prizes out. It's, it's a whole lot of fun. Um, so it's an absolute honor that I've even been asked and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to kind of get rolling with that with them. You've awesome. been on it yourself, haven't you, Richard? So, you know, what I have, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoy it. I, th I think it's a lot of fun. And I mean, I can't always like be there for the whole thing because you guys go on for six, yeah. eight hours sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, and, and just because of the time difference, usually you guys start and I'm at work and then I come home and have dinner and stuff like that. And then by the time I'm able to like kind of sit down and, and join in, you guys are, uh, you know, starting to like wrap up <laughs> get, or, or, or you're already drunk a little loose yeah <laughs> i was trying to think of a nice way of saying that but yeah you guys are already shit-faced <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. i think I'm we're gonna start kidding. behaving a little bit um i've been told by several uh, of the people in the chat that i'm a bad influence are you <laughs> yeah, it's because you got a shaved head and a red beard they, they always assume that we're we're the ones causing all the problems yeah reprobates i believe the term <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of fun. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's tarantula and invert themed and related, I guess, but it, you know, you guys really kind of just talk about it. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It's yeah. Like, it's, like, it's like, kinda like kind of like we have tonight, uh, today, you know, uh, it's, yeah. we talk about, we talk about the passions that we, we share and, um, and then every now and then someone will throw in some conversation about some real world stuff. Cause it obviously affects all of us and it's just nice to hear. I think a lot of people have built relationships with, with, with the existing tarantula uh, tuber hosts. Um, yeah. And I've, I've been on for the last three weeks, believe it or not. So I think that's why they've sort of gone, hey, Danny, would you, would you like to be involved permanently? Yeah. Um, people are kind of getting used to, to my ginger beard. And uh, as you know, it's, it's the best look. So It is. Um, it is. But some people find it offensive at first. They got to warm up to it. They, you know, they're just like, whoa. <laughs> Pale skin and a bright red beard? What in the world? <laughs> I know. For, for people who are very sensitive to heat, you know, this fiery, flamey beard should be. Yeah. <laughs> you know. It's a good look on you. I, I dig it. Uh, I actually, uh, I, in my last video, I was like wearing this monk costume. And I like at the very beginning I, and I, I pull the hood off to like say whatever it is I'm saying. And that was like the most uh, frequent comment on that video was people like, oh my God, I've never seen without your hat on. I didn't realize you had a shaved head. <laughs> it's like yeah yeah and, and i forget i wear hats so much just because I call it a warrior cut you know yeah i they dig it they, yeah they can't grab your hair so it's, it's the yeah. warrior cut <laughs> they grab your chin <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean part of the reason i wear a hat so much is one i'm I'm too lazy to shave my head regularly so it sometimes it's just all stubbly and weird looking um but also uh I get such bad sunburns on the top of my head. So, like, if I'm going out, I'm wearing a hat. <laughs> and uh, well, there's um, a sun. In, uh, uh, it's not very sunny in Manchester. Uh, yeah, that's what I hear. So, so yeah, we I, I don't have that issue as much. But when it, <laughs> we do get that that brief moment of sunshine, it's uh, it's lovely. And I do go yeah. outside. But the fact of fifties on straight away, you know, the the strong uh, SPF sun cream, right? <laughs> yeah. And one of the things I, I like a lot about the, uh, the tarantula tubers Saturday night takeaway is one, it's not the name like that is such a mouthful. <laughs> I'm like, Oh man, I always screw it up. So I, <laughs> yeah. the, the name is not my favorite part, but it's it, the, just the whole thing is it, it reminds me of like, um, you know, like, like going to the bar with some friends, you know, from work or something like that, you know, like it's just, you're kind of, sometimes you're talking about work. Sometimes you're talking about relationships. Sometimes you're talking about whatever's happening in the world. Like it's, it, it kind of gives that like that in a virtual way, which I think is is awesome. And the fact that you let anybody kind of drove for it, right? yeah, that's what they yeah. went for. And you guys let you know other people get involved. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like if I'm hanging out in the chat, sometimes they'll they'll shoot me a link and like, hey, why don't you come up on screen for a few minutes? I see Alex. I see. I mean, there's all kinds of people. You don't have to be a a YouTuber, you know, to get invited up and 
and speak. And then it's just, there's completely, uh, you know, side conversations going on in the live chat, you know, that, and it's just, it, it's cool to, to be able to have like some kind of commonplace for people that share the, the love of the hobby to, you know, kind of sit around a water hole and, you know, talk about all, all things in and life. Have a beer and talk about these things. Yeah. I think uh, like you get people from all over the world on that chat as well, which is really cool. Some of you might be having breakfast. Some of you just finishing work. Some of you uh, might have stayed up really late to watch it. Uh, others are on like, on the UK's time scale, so they're 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 staying up with us. And then you'll get people saying "shot, shot, shots" in the thing, and it's like, oh god, here it goes. <laughs> so then you you're drinking more and you're just having fun and making people laugh and just being silly. And it is like it is like having a bunch of friends around a watering hole and or at the pub or at the bar and yeah. it's just nice and i feel super welcomed by them like they're they're such such nice people i don't know if you know the names of all the groups but you've got alternate inverts uh pet rock and roll mr grindler's creatures couch lots arachnophobia and you also um unfortunately is now taken as an absence but you had um is it invert kingdom uk uh Cydex. He was one of the old school uh, YouTubers who was up. He's been doing it for quite a while now as well. Um, I believe I'll be taking um, his spot for a while. I don't know if he'll be coming back at any point. Um, I have to pry it from my cold dead, but uh, no, it's you know, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> no, he's it, he's they're all lovely and they're all dead supportive of a uh, supportive. That's not even a word. Supportive of 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 what I do with keeper cards. Um, sure. I'm not a YouTuber, so. Being on a tube of Saturday night takeaway gives me an opportunity to talk to people and, and share my knowledge a little bit in a, in in another way other than just my cards, you know. Yeah. I, I mean for a guy that's not a YouTuber, you certainly I see your face on YouTube quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think pretty soon you're not gonna be able to say that. <laughs> like you know, maybe you don't have your own channel, but <laughs> I like uh, the idea that I just drift between the channels. Yeah. I actually had Amy from Pet Rock and Roll on the podcast. We recorded one uh, last week or two weeks ago. Um, I was very excited. Uh, unfortunately, I'm new to this, so I recorded the whole thing, talking into you know this big fancy mic here, uh, but none of my recording software had this mic selected, so I was actually using recording from the mic on my laptop, which I was looking away from. So <laughs> it's like... I spent about three hours trying to master and engineer the the audio so that it sounded it halfway decent. And <laughs> you know, after you know, all kinds of noise gates and filters and equalizers and, and every trick that I could find on the internet, I was like, I spent more time trying to make this sound good than I did actually recording it. And it sounds worse now than it did just straight off this. So I just I was like, Amy, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm deleting the entire thing, and we're just gonna have to record this again. So. Yeah, that's something to look forward to. She will be on the podcast in a future episode. Um, I just have to record it again. Hopefully this time. not. Was her really. voice loud enough? You should have just re-recorded your bits. <laughs> it's kind of difficult to do in a conversation, though, you know, and sound genuine. <laughs> it's, um, but I've mean, got all kinds of... Um, I'm getting ready to record a podcast with... Um, I don't know if you guys know him over in the UK, but uh, uh, Peter from uh, Bugs in Cyberspace. He's like the largest pet insect dealer in the u.s like he doesn't deal in tarantulas um doesn't really deal in scorpions but like if you're looking for a mantis or trapdoor spiders stick bugs beetles all you know all those kind of inverts yeah he is he is the dude um russ from aquarimax pets it's a great youtube channel um I, I, somebody i use a lot yeah i, I mean like I found him because i was looking for care on the tailless whip scorpion which sometimes can be a little difficult to find you know, reliable information on those and Vingaroons and stuff. He had some some great videos on that that were very educational. And what do you feed yours? Just just out just while we're talking about Vingaroons. My Vinger I haven't fed my Vingaroon in probably six months now. But what I was feeding it was uh crickets. Mine got pregnant and had babies and she's not interested in eating right. or doing anything. I've had mine I've had mine for probably about twelve months now going on. Yeah, I think I got mine for Christmas last year in a scorpion pack uh, that my, my brother and sister were so kind to get me. And I think I fed it once. Yeah. Legitimately. I tried, I try, I've done the whole like leaving dead food in there just in case he gets hungry. I just end up pulling out a dead cricket a couple of days later. 
Um, I've tried holding the cricket in place. I've tried worms. I've tried. I've tried everything. This thing does just doesn't want to eat. So I hear that from a lot of people. Um, mine, I didn't realize it at the time. She was gravid, so I think that's why she was. She had much more of an appetite. I mean, I would feed her once a month. I drop in a couple crickets. She'd usually eat them, um, and then she like burrowed down. I didn't see her for kind of like, and it was winter. I know they kind of and not really hibernate, but they kind of go to ground and don't really come up until it starts warming up which is something I learned from Aquarium Max Pets video. So I wasn't too worried about it. Um, but then I was like, it's warm. The basement temperatures warmed up. It's, it's like March, April. Like it should be coming back out wanting some food. And I was like, well, I'm going to like make sure it's still alive. So I kind of like dug around a little bit and realized that what, when I did a video on her, um, people were saying like, your, your Vengaroon has a tumor or something's wrong with it. It's abdomen. Cause it's like really swollen on one side. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of noticed. I didn't notice that when I got her. Like, that wasn't the case. I have video evidence of that because I did an unboxing when I came back from the, the reptile show with her. And so it's something that's developed. And I know she was eating a lot. So I was like, well, maybe she's just fat. And for whatever reasons, storing all of her fat on one side, not the other. But when I, I dug her, I was like, I'm, I'm going to look for her. And I, I pulled it up and she had an egg sack. And I was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> like, uh, that, so she was pregnant. That's what was up. But, and everybody's like, well, now she's going to die and you're not going to have any babies because it's very rare. They're successful in captivity. And I was like, well, that's, that's a bummer because she won't eat when she has them. And so I've been like kind of monitoring her, but not bothering her like maybe once every three or four weeks she could, for whatever reason, she made a burrow underneath a water dish. And that's where she's like having her little brood. So I'll just kind of gently pull up the water dish and, and look down there. Um, and she had like a big egg sack, looked like maybe a dozen eggs, but I only saw about five babies after they had hatched, like on her abdomen and, uh, like on her back. And last time I looked, there was only like two or three. So I don't know how this is going to go. Yeah. And I tried to offer her a dead cricket and stuff like that. She was, she had no interest in anything I was doing. I don't want so to. It's not her. just me who's struggling with them. Then I, I, I legitimately thought maybe I'm doing something wrong. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're tough. They are. They are they're rewarding. If you, I guess if you can look after them properly, I just don't really know what I'm doing wrong. But yeah, I mean, I think it's like with tarantulas too. They just have a low metabolism, and you know, just they don't need to eat that often. I think like my tailless whip scorpion, I feed it once a month. If I put it, if I feed it any more frequently than that, it, it's just crickets hopping around the enclosure. You know, <laughs> so uh, they just don't eat that much. Um, but are. are are you going to, you mentioned, you kind of like hinted at this, but like are Vingaroons, Taylor Swift Scorpions, you know, other Scorpions, Isopods, I mean, will there be keeper cards on those? Yeah, um, I'm mid-production of a an invert starter pack. Um, I've already got all the species that I, I've, I'm basically researching. Um, this, this is going to be a lot more varied, just tarantulas. So we're going to be covering scorpions, centipedes, millipedes, cockroaches, uh, mantids. Uh, I, I kind of want to delve into ants. I want to look at uh, true spiders as well. There's, there's a lot to put into a starter pack for inverts because there's a lot of different inverts. But the idea is I, I create a universal invert pack and then start doing uh, expansions that will basically, you know, I, I'll, I'll be able to open up new avenues and new doors. Um, yeah. And see what people want, really, because the centipede market is, is, is kind of growing. Uh, I know, like, there's a lot of people who, who exclusively only keep scorpions, and then, and then away from inverts and uh, and arachnids in general. I, I mean, I think I want to I want to be looking at reptiles as well. I want to look at snakes, and there's there's a lot of scope because you know people keep animals, and keeper guards will be covering what people keep essentially. So, yeah. yeah I mean, in, in the next few years, we'll hopefully I'll have a whole line of different different bits and different things, and hopefully at one at some point I won't necessarily have to do it through Kickstarter. Um, not to say I'm not I, I like I like Kickstarter, but I would love to be able to fund this all myself. You know, um, right. the invert shows I was planned to go to all around the UK this year was actually going to be funding the expansion pack, but none of the invert shows happened, so inevitably this is where I'm up to. Um, but you know, it's, I'm getting the exposures definitely uh, increase in the sales. Um, I would like this to be my full time job. I, I wish, I wish this is my full time job. Just being able to spend all day researching, making these new cards, and and, and providing this information to people that would be amazing. Oh, yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, I, I wish this would be my full-time job as well, you know, but I think as people like you are, are doing this and, you know, as the ho- it just kind of helps the hobby grow and become more reputable and the larger the hobby gets, um, the, the more possibility it, it, there becomes for people like us to be able to focus primarily on this as, you know, cause I mean, I, I would do this whether I get paid, uh, you know, for it or not, but, uh, it, it does give, give me the ability to focus more on the content I'm creating and the research I can put into it and the quality of the videos and stuff like that. So, you know, it, 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 it helps out the hobby, you know, I can do what I love. You can do what you love and we can make enough money to pay our bills and, and continue doing that. So we can, uh, that'd, you know, be a, uh, that'd be a bonus, wouldn't it? I, yeah. I, this doesn't pay my bills yet, but it, it, it definitely, um, it helps me. It, it's, it's still, it's still an entity and it's still, I'm still driving forward because of the people who support me, the, the, sure. the, the people who buy the cards, uh, the people who recommend to their friends, they buy the cards. One of the recently, there was a post on social media of a, uh, a couple who are about to get married and she got him a signed Corey Taylor um, LP, I think it was from Slipknot. Um, he got her one of all the keeper cards to start a pack. <laughs> And I was, awesome. and that, she was like, "Oh my god, we're so perfect for each other." And I'm just thinking, "That's so amazing." My my card is from a wedding gift, you know. Like, I, I love that, and and yeah. that that's the kind of reaction we get from people. Then I had another guy saying that uh, all the kings and queens and emperors around the world, uh, and prime ministers and presidents, should shout from the top of the top of the hills about keeper cards. Um, I personally have been selling more of my spiders uh, recently because I can show my customers what they're going to grow into. So mm. if it helps, then amazing, you know, like that's, that's what it's all about. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a big supporter. I highly suggest everybody, you know, support your Kickstarter. And if somebody isn't able to get on the Kickstarter or they weren't able to get on the last Kickstarter, you do have those available for sale just directly from your website. Right. So if they wanted to get something right now, they can. Absolutely. Uh, okay. If you want, if you want to, you can get the Kickstarter, uh, so you get the Keeper Card Starter Pack alongside the expansion on, on Kickstarter. That's a bundle option. But at the same time, if you, if you can't wait um, and you, or you, you want to be sure that these are for you, then you can get our Starter Packs as well as we do have some of our YouTube channel hero cards left. Um, I am dramatically selling out of the chat ones. Your, yours have nearly gone. Um, the, the PSP ones have nearly all gone. So people are picking them up, um, and then af- after the expansion pack, I think I'll be extending that YouTube line as well as uh, I'm also I've got quite a lot in the work. I'm also working on an Australian species pack, which won't be a massive full pack because everything over there is like just something species something. I'm, I'm going to be covering maybe twelve of the actual confirmed ones. Um, so I've had a lot of Australians go, "Hey, we." We don't have any of these ones. Can you make some for us? So I'm like, yeah, of course I can. Yeah, I get a lot of a lot of comments and messages from people from Australia that are like, "Hey, can you do a video on an Australian species?" And I'm like, "No, I, I don't. I don't own any Australian species." So unfortunately, I can't. But you know, maybe one day. Yeah. One thing we haven't mentioned is like, uh, if they wanted to get the first starter pack, how much does that cost? Like, what's the price of something like that? Uh, the first starter pack is fifteen UK pounds, uh, which I think is less than $20. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, the information, I, I don't think it's, I think it's about the same price as a pack of cigarettes in some places, or a pack, like a pack and a half of fags, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's not break the bank money or anything like that. And <laughs> what you're getting on there is, is, is reasonably priced. I, I like to believe anyway. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, you're talking about, you know, those European high taxes. <laughs> Back when I smoked cigarettes, it was like four bucks or something like that. I know it's gone up since then, but yeah. Yeah, I wish cigarettes over here. I mean, I don't smoke. Uh, I haven't smoked for a long time now, but yeah, you're looking at maybe like 10 pounds, 12 pounds, which is like yeah. it's to $15. So uh, yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, they're high quality. They, they, I, I suggest, I think they're very cool, um, especially if, if you're into collecting cards and stuff like that it's it's even a better value it's just um, more things if you like tarantulas and you've got if you've got loads of tarantulas it's just something else to get you know i, I i've 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 pretty much exhausted all the publications 
um, in, in our starter pack, so in our new expansion pack, we actually feature, I don't know if you've heard of it, Richard, it's uh, lovetarantulas.com, uh, which is Andrew Smith. And Andrew Smith is a prolific um, entomologist, uh, tarantula expert. He's actually got one of our packs of cards. Um, but I featured his website as a card itself. See if I can dig it out and show you real quick. Um, but, I mean, he's not asked me to plug him. And I just kind of wanted to plug him because he's one of the only people I know that actively tries to fundraise so that he can continue to release new documentaries because they go they go on t in, into different countries and they go hunting for these tarantulas and they, they put these documentaries together. There's some on YouTube. Uh, otherwise, you can buy his DVDs on lovetarantulas.com. But um, not very focused. But, yeah, this, this guy is a hero in the tarantula world. And I think you get more people like that, you know, I'm sure you'd do the same, Richard. If you could, you could go out there and start going through the rainforests, and you know, oh, like in a heartbeat, yeah. yeah, man. Like so, this guy, I don't know how old he is, but he's been doing it for years. He uh, he produced the first ever a one of I mean, it might have been like, might have been the first ever tarantula documentary in the UK um, that was on like mainstream television. So he's 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 a little bit of a hero of mine. So I was like, and well deserved, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've I've been following that guy for a while. He's, he's got some, uh, some some. He's got a YouTube channel, website, all that stuff. You can get DVDs. Yeah, I think he's releasing some new ones soon. So, like, just if you get a chance, people watching or listening, Andrew Smith's Love Tarantulas. He's the man yeah. to go check out. You know. Yeah, actually, uh, there was I was driving through town the other day, and there was a Jeep, and it had that kind of Madonna, like his little logo. Uh, it looked like that, and I was like. Oh, it's another tarantula keeper. And then I was like, oh, wait, no, that's just a picture of Madonna. <laughs> it's not love tarantulas. Uh, I got excited for a second. I'm in the same boat as you. Like, I mean, I'm in a, even, I'm in a small town um, compared to Manchester. And so, like, I know one girl that keeps tarantulas. It's like my friend's daughter, you know? So it's not appropriate for, you know, a guy pushing 38, hanging out with a 16 year old girl. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes we'll, I'll answer questions she might have, but, you know, it, there's, there's, um, yeah, I don't really know anybody my age in this area. I did meet one girl, uh, but she's like an hour away. You know, her and her husband. I sold them some scorpions, and they, they're cool people. But it's not not somebody that's like down the street I can like hang out with. We're very uh, we're very much all quite distant from each other, but thankfully the internet, you know, it, we get to connect that way. And exactly, I think at one point the other like not long ago, I was talking to some people from Canada, a couple of people from North America, and I was also talking to someone from Australia at the same, all within like the same same chat you know it's just that's amazing I, I might not have people right next door to me but i certainly have enough people out there who share this passion so thank you to yeah. everybody yeah that's very awesome i was actually planning this summer to go down to puerto rico uh, my wife and i were going to fly down there and we we're gonna i kind of had this whole thing set up where i was gonna somebody was gonna uh take us out to like the little jungle area out there so we can find some avicularia species and uh, I was really excited about that, and we, I, you know, I planned heading out southwest and pretty much anywhere I could go without a passport uh, because I was having some issues with, <laughs> with that for mistakes I've made in my past. I had to get all that stuff cleared up before I could do that and actually be allowed to leave the country. <laughs> but Puerto Rico, you just have to have a driver's license. They're, they're, you don't, since they're a territory, yeah, you don't have to have a passport. Um, but then COVID came, and it was like, well, let's nix all of those plans <laughs> maybe next year. Uh, we were so, we were due to go over to the uh, over to the your side. Uh, we were going to go to state, uh, the states. Um, we were supposed to go last year, and we weren't, we weren't able to go. Um, and now, I mean, God knows what's going to happen. Like we're currently banned from all sort of outside travel. And then, if you can travel, you've got to do a two week sort of um, quarantine there, two week quarantine when you get back. So that two week holiday turns into a six week excursion because you've got to spend four weeks of it just locked up in a house somewhere. Yeah, um, but hopefully, you know, next year, um, if if all goes well and things open up again, the UK is talking about the springtime, so we'll find out soon enough. Um, but I'd like to get back over there and maybe do a little tour and come and see some of the come and see people like yourself, and you know, just make make a trip of it, go around the states and go see all the different tubers and all the different like all the hobbyists and folks that I've had the opportunity to meet and. Uh, opportunity sorry, to talk to and, and get to know a little bit. That would be awesome. You'd be more than welcome to stop by. We could do the podcast in person. That would be great. <laughs> I 
and West Virginia as well. Like I'd, I'd love to visit. Oh, it is it is gorgeous. It is probably. I mean, I've been all over the country, and with the exception of Arizona, this is like my favorite state. It's just it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, but man, I really appreciate you, you know, taking time and, and coming on the podcast and talking to me and, uh, I'm very excited to, uh, very excited to open up this new box, uh, tomorrow and, and check out exactly what's in there. And I'll be sure to get, get some good video and pictures of the stuff. And so if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see all kinds of B-roll, uh, I'll drop in while we're talking. So you don't have to look at our big red beards the entire time. You can get some nice pictures of the, of, of what these keeper cards are and, Man, and thank you for everything you're doing for the hobby, man. I think this is this is very cool. Kind of you know normalizing tarantulas, getting good information out there, and you know it, it's awesome. So no, thank uh, you for helping me, man. Yeah, yeah. Anytime. I hope I hope you'll be willing to come back on the future. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, maybe yeah. maybe it's part of the tarantula tube of Saturday night takeaway. Well, we'll get everyone in. All right, that sounds cool, man. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening to the podcast and uh, and tuning in today. Uh, you can find the podcast I upload uh, once a week, usually on Thursdays, and we're on Google Podcast, Apple, Stitcher, I mean, Spotify, any, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find the Exotic Pet Collective. Uh, you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel, the Exotic Pet Collective, and uh, you get alerted every time I upload a podcast. I'll do a, a video version. Usually comes up uh, a few hours or the next day after I uploaded um, the, just the, the audio podcast, but I appreciate all you all uh, watching and listening and just kind of supporting and hanging out. And be sure to check out Keeper Cards. That's KeeperCards.info if you want uh, to pick up your own Keeper Cards or uh, get in on the Kickstarter. I know Danny would really appreciate having you, um, helping him out. And, um, yeah, other than that, thank you guys for listening, and I will, uh, we'll, we'll talk next week. All right. You all have a nice day. We'll see you later. <laughs>